Whitney, the ring, it chose you. Take it. Place the ring on the lantern. Place the ring. Speak the oath. Great honor. Responsibility. Etc. <laughs> so on. Okay, okay. You clearly need some help. I'll just take you to the... What, what does he say? The nearest doctor that treats purple aliens. Lantern! Okay, okay. We'll take you to the camping store and we'll get you a lantern. Is that what you need? Do you need a lantern? Yes. I have a flashlight on my keychain. Will that do? Yes, please. Here you go. Ooh. I can distract my cat with this. Greetings, friends. Welcome back to Critically Acclaimed, the film review podcast where highbrow and lowbrow collide! Uh I don't know why I said it that way. It has to be dramatic. Dramatic? Dramatic me? What? My my name is Whitney Seibold. I am a film critic for the entirety of the internet. And uh, you may call me whatever you like, just don't call me late for dinner. Uh, Late for dinner, and I will be reviewing a bunch of movies this week. Who the hell are you? My name is William Bibiani. I am a film critic for the internet as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everybody calls me Bibbs. I don't call you Bibbs. I care about you too much. Everybody uh, uh, who counts (laughs) calls me Bibbs. And uh, this week, uncritically acclaimed, uh, we have an odd cavalcade of films. No two are alike. It's a very... Well... Well, maybe so. Theoretically, you made some choices this week, and they're interesting. Uh, (laughs) This week on the uh, the B-Movies Podcast. That's our old podcast. It is the old podcast. This week on Critically Acclaimed. Mm -hmm. uh, This week on Critically Acclaimed, we are reviewing Deadpool 2, Cargo, Fahrenheit 451, and we have a very, very distinctive double feature... Uh, the n- most notorious film of which was chosen by you, our listeners, on our Facebook page. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we'll get it to was that. All, in a bit. It was all superheroes. It was. It was all super, superheroes. A big business. Yes. So we chose a, a, a trio of bad superhero movies. Put them up yes. on the Schmoville exclamation point Facebook uh, group, and you were allowed to vote, and you chose. Well, it's just a pretty bad one. Of course, we offered you nothing but bad ones, but you... you to varying degrees. I suppose so. Yeah, we, you, your choices were a, D, a bad DC movie, a bad Marvel movie, and a bad Image movie, of which there are, of course, so many. And uh, you chose well, who, a bad DC movie. Who could forget the Cyber Force feature film, or the... Did they do, uh, did they, did they do that? No, I'm just trying to think of other image titles. Oh, yeah. You could forget the Youngblood feature film or the uh, Wild C A T S. Or was it W I L D Cats or was it Wild C A T S? It was Wild C A T S. Okay. Wild the Wildcats feature film. And who could forget the Rex Reed's classic review of Pit? It's the Pits, (laughs) he said. I I remembered Pit. Mm. One of the big features. I remember, of Image, like there were like five issues spread out over the course of fifteen years. Yeah, yeah, that was the great thing about Image Comics. They said, "Hey, artists, you can make up your own characters and write the comics." Oh, so it'll be really badly written then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the. Uh, that's well, that's it. not. It'll be really, sure. really well. Uh, Sam Keith's The Max is one of the best things ever. But uh, yeah, I think Savage Dragon had some really good fun. Stories I, I didn't too. read Savage yeah, Dragon, yeah. but uh, yeah, they they let them sort of set their own schedule as well. So like months would elapse in between issues, mm-hmm. and you never knew when you were going to get a new one. You just knew you were going to buy it for all those pretty images. Keep checking back. And uh, one of the big features was the letters columns. Uh, Well, like they they were, most comics had letters columns in the end. Fans could write in. Uh, Image comics went way overboard. Like sometimes half the comic would be just letters from fans. I was actually, I had a letter published in an image comic. (gasps) Really? Yeah, in an issue of Freak Force. (laughs) <laughs> which was a spin-off of the Savage Dragon. It's like Freak Force number eight. Okay. And I remember, wow, it ran eight issues. And I that was, many. It was one. Yeah, that one, that one lasted a bit. But All like, right. uh, I had a series of questions. And I'll, mm-hmm. I'll always remember, um, mm-hmm. there was a character in Freak Force called Super Patriot. Mm-hmm. And I remember Super Patriot. Like many mm-hmm. superheroes in the 90s. Um, one of the things he had on his outfit were lots of pouches. 
That was a Rob Liefeld thing. Yeah, just pouches galore, pouches yeah. everywhere. And we'll, we'll get back to Rob Liefeld when we talk about Deadpool. Oh, cause... yes. But uh, I asked, I asked Eric Larson, um, what's he put in all those pouches? Mm-hmm. And Eric Larson said, Tums. <laughs> Tums. It's all Tums. And I, ne- I n- always remembered that. I always thought that was pretty fun. They were very game about asking stupid questions. And, and I remember in the Pit comic, somebody wrote it. Pit is uh, like a Hulk-like being who is like the spiritual double of some little boy. I don't exactly remember what the premise yeah, he was, was. He was like this. He protected a little boy. Yeah. And he was, was a big like, monster. It was like Gamera and like those kids that Gamera befriends, mm. but Gamera is just the Hulk. Essentially just the Hulk. But yeah. he but he's like has red eyes and no nose. Mm-hmm. Somebody asked if the... If Pitt has no nose, how does he get mucus out of his body? That's a because fair question. Because we, we need to know these things when we're in junior I'm high school. I'm glad they didn't ask, how does he smell? And then they and could have just said, awful. Awful, yeah. And, 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 and the, the, art, the artist and writer of Pitt wrote back, said, I don't know. Maybe he just hawks a bunch of loogies. Hmm. It's like, and you know what? Something was completed inside of me and another part of me died the day I read that letter. <laughs> We'll these, talk about these were my, of, my my formative comic reading years were dominated by thoughts of image comics. We'll, we'll talk about mucus and parts of us dying when we get to Green Lantern later <laughs> in the episode. In the meantime, <laughs> let's talk about a new release movie. It's one of the it's a huge opening weekend. It's not like Avengers Infinity War numbers, but very but it, few movies it, ever it, get it that. It beat it at the box office. It this did weekend. very well. Yeah. Let's talk about Deadpool two, the uh, sequel. To what's eating Gilbert Grape? Um, it was a weird turn for that they series. They really pivoted yeah. real hard. Um, Deadpool 2, uh, from the same screenwriters as Deadpool 1, but a new director. Uh, and that, uh, Ryan Reynolds has an official uh, and a, uh, writing although, credit in this from, one. From what I understand, he also contributed a lot to the attitude and yeah. uh, he didn't like sit down and write it, but I he was know. responsible he's for got a lot of the, He's got a the, writing the humor credit. and the attitude. And now he has a writing credit. Um, yeah. Deadpool, uh, kind of was a, a shot in the arm for, uh, all the superhero genre, which was very uh, portentous, took itself very seriously. Even when the, mm. you're dealing with something like guardians of the galaxy, which has talking raccoons and stuff, there was still an earnestness yeah. that, uh, that desperately needed the piss taken out of it. And Deadpool came along and did that. Well, it, there was... it was at least a little different. It was uh, refreshingly crass. It's the first superhero film to be rated R since I think it had been a while, Spoil, or I guess the the Wolverine also did it, but the well, well or not, Wolverine not the Wolverine, had an all rated um, Logan did it. Yeah. Logan did it afterwards. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, there was this time when we kind of needed a bunch of sincere superhero stories because mm-hmm. people weren't taking them seriously, mm-hmm. and then we'd had enough of them yeah. by the time Deadpool come around, probably enough of them and then some that a a self aware satirical superhero story mm-hmm. uh, that took the piss out of the entire genre mm-hmm. was more than welcome. And yet, I really do love the first Deadpool movie because on top of that, it is an emotional storyline. It is mm-hmm. actually like a good movie. It's not just a funny comedy. I, I think it, it functions well as a movie. I wouldn't say it's, you know, high cinema or, you know, oh, does deeply, it have to be? Deep, it just, deep, it just deeply works. emotional or anything. I think know? I think there is an emotional core mm-hmm. of that to that movie that is rather genuine. Okay. And you get to see that Deadpool's uh, sense of humor is a defense mechanism, mm-hmm. that it is uh, him dealing with his own like sort of self-hatred mm-hmm. and um and honestly that first movie is very successful. I would actually mm-hmm. consider it one of the better superhero movies period. Bold statement. Yeah. I, I I loved it too. I I think I put it on my top ten list just because it was so fresh. Mm-hmm. And uh, now we have Deadpool two, and uh, Deadpool two is uh, essentially another verse of the same song. Yeah. Uh, the the joke has not been expanded upon. Uh, the, the joke with Deadpool is that he's kind of aware that he's in a movie, and he co- breaks the fourth wall, addresses the audience, and comments on that the fact that he's in a movie. Uh, he makes references to actors and refers to Ryan Reynolds, who mm. plays Deadpool. Yeah. And uh, and it's all very funny. It, in fact, some scenes are downright hilarious. There's The sense of humor remains and mm. remains strong throughout. Yeah. What this movie has, and I think uh, this is a very fair way to put it, uh, is a serious case of sequelitis. 
it's a lot the, the same more thing of it. again. Yeah, it's a lot. It's the same thing, but a lot more of it. Now, mm-hmm. unlike something that like I wasn't a huge fan of the second Austin Powers movie because I don't know anybody it, who is, I know yeah. people who are, but like right. my thing is this: it's just the first one, but more of it and more crass. Mm. And maybe if it was the first one, I would have been okay with that, but it wasn't. I'd seen it before. Here, you know, they run into first off, you know, it's just built around a whole bunch of different set pieces. And we got to get to them regardless mm-hmm. of whether or not that feels organic to the story um but for me the real problem is it's got when you're doing a sequel and you want the sequel to be good you're not just doing a cash and sequel you want it mm. to be good you're typically doing a sequel to like an action movie or something taken kind of kind of seriously and there are more stories to be told with the character when you're doing a story with a comedy usually comedies kind of wrap everything up pretty yeah, tidily yeah. and that's something that happened in the first deadpool where yeah it was an emotional storyline but everything kind of came together at the end mm-hmm. it's like uh, you look at something like city slickers it's a cute movie <laughs> it's a cute movie about a bunch of guys having their midlife crisis they go off on like a cattle ranching vacation and then they're 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 tested by the elements and at the end they feel they're reborn at the end it was very successful it's a funny movie sequel comes along what do we do we got nothing now they're gonna hunt for gold like, like we got nothing left. And, and Jack Palance comes back as his character's twin brother. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say there's nothing else to explore with Deadpool. I think that's a huge exaggeration. The character's been around for a long time. There are lots of stories to tell. But the first thing that happens in this movie, and this isn't a spoiler, it's like five minutes into the film, mm-hmm. uh, they basically pull a born supremacy, and it was just like, oh, wait, it ended too happily. We'll just kill Deadpool's girlfriend. Yeah. And... I got to tell you, like, I, that seems like such a cheap shot. I think even the movie recognizes that it's a cheap, like, dramatic, like, well, uh, punch. And, like, then it just sends him off on this journey to, like, find his heart. And I'm like, he found it in the beginning. Like, at the beginning of the movie is a montage of him killing bad guys. Mm. He's not a villain who needs to be redeemed. He's an anti-hero at most. And so kind of his whole emotional journey feels really forced to me here. So all the movie well, has the, left to rely on is the comedy, but fortunately that's funny. Yeah, the comedy is really funny. The plotting is really weak. Uh, I, I had I had known this term, but it, it was sort of being bandied about in some criticism of this movie, but uh, fridging yeah. is, uh, is a term that referred to, I think it was a came out of a comic book. It was a Green Lantern comic. A Green Lantern comic book, where yeah. the, in order to give, and this is... Ha- it do- didn't start here, but this is where the, like the term came from. Yeah, where uh, to give a male protagonist a motivation in a story, they do something really horrible to their girlfriend or their wife, in the usually case, by murdering them. In, in the case of Green Lantern, mm-hmm. memory serves. Uh, mm-hmm. he, she was literally in his refrigerator. Yeah, body. like they, they murdered the female yeah. character and stuffed her in a refrigerator. And some uh, critic, I forgot her name, Gail Simone. Ga- oh, Gail Simone, who ended up, up with, becoming a very talented uh, comic writer in her own right. Okay, uh, Gail yeah. Simone. Came came up with the term fridging to refer to this phenomenon, yeah. which of course, you know, stretches back to the 1930s and even before, you know, murder the female character. Now the problem is, uh, Morena Baccarin, who plays the, the quote, the girlfriend character was Vanessa. She has a Vanessa, uh, who plays Vanessa, who played Vanessa in the first one, plays Vanessa again in this one. Uh, was great. She was a, an interesting, dynamic, damaged person who connected with uh, Wade, the Deadpool character, really, really strongly. And they actually had good conversations yeah, they were and a lot characters. of really great chemistry. And they were actually a good pair. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just a matter of the hero having a girlfriend character, mm-hmm. which we'll talk about when we get to Green Lantern. Hmm. But uh, that that they took this interesting, dynamic person and just fridged her is didn't sit well with me and it was kind of lingering in the back of my head throughout this entire movie even as I'm laughing at all this like great meta humor it it reduces a great character to a plot point which Mm. is again something else I did in the Bourne Supremacy it opens the same way Um, and on, on top of it, like you're really only doing it to give like a shot of dramatic adrenaline to a story because you need to put something there. I don't think you needed it. Honestly, I think you could have told the story begins with him and Vanessa and they decide they're going to have a kid. Mm. And then like literally the same scene, she dies. And then it's about Deadpool, uh, 
kind of fighting his way out of his depression. Yeah, yeah he's, he's depressed. He, he tries to kill himself. He finds out he can't do that because his mutant healing factor is too powerful. And mm. that leads to some humor. Like, like he, can, he can literally be like just completely disembodied and uh, mm-hmm. that'll he can still grow back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then he ends up like in, he ends up being picked up by Colossus. Uh, brought back to the X-Men mansion. There's a really funny joke in that mansion I'm not going to ruin for you, but it made me laugh so hard. Like, it was really <laughs> great. And then he be, and then he goes on an X-Men mission with Colossus and Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Mm. Uh, both great characters. And he runs across a, a character played by that kid from Hunt for the Wilder People. Oh, I forgot the actor's name. I'm going to yeah. look up his name. He's a delight, and mm. he's really, really, really great. Um... But uh, he runs across a kid who was living at a sort of school for orphaned well, mutants, and it turns out that it's really abusive and horrifying. Mm. And then he, on top of that, he runs into Cable, played by Josh Brolin, who has come back in time to basically do the plot of Looper, and well, he's he, going to have to kill that kid in order to save the future, specifically his family. And, and wouldn't you know it, has the same backstory. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, his family, his, his like wife died, and mm. blah, blah, blah. Uh, the oh god, where's the kid? I'm trying. I'm looking at the name. Uh, oh. Julian Dennison. That's Julian Dennison. I like that yeah. actor a lot. He's fun. Um, he's he's really funny. He's funny. Yeah. He's great. If you if you saw Hunt, for, if you haven't seen Hunt for the Wilder People, people listening to this podcast, if you haven't seen Hunt for the Wilder People, it's the movie Taika Waititi directed after what we do in the shadows, but before Thor Ragnarok, mm-hmm. and it is. Great. Sam Neill is in that. It's one. a really great movie mm-hmm. that not enough people saw. Um, but look, my thing is this: it's about him sort of learning to mm. emotionally attach himself again and protect this kid. You already have a story about him potentially becoming a father, having a lot of anxiety about like his father was apparently crap, mm. was something I'd never really get into. Um, but like you, that would have been enough. Mm-hmm. Him connecting with a kid, feeling like he's not a, potentially a good father. He just goes off on this adventure with this kid. Mm-hmm. That's enough of an emotional hook for this movie. Turning Vanessa into this really shallow this, plot this point. sacrificial it's, lamb. It's really lame. And now they find ways to deal with that that I'm not going to ruin for you that mm-hmm. might mitigate that problem depending on how you look at it. This, this mm-hmm. critique we have of the movie's plot. Uh, however, the whole movie basically relies on it, and mm. it's frustrating just because, again, it just it, it, mo- it's not good plotting. I'm well, sorry, it's just really uh, here, lame. Here's the thing: they could have easily. I mean, this is a, a meta humor kind of movie. They, mm-hmm. They're constantly addressing how this movie is functioning as they go forward. And the whole credit sequence um, is about the plot point we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, which, which again is a repeated joke, which is frustrating, but. Uh, th- one of my favorite gags in the movie is this cute little quick visual gag where they're talking about um, going into the film's climax and talking their plan. And this is what we do when we break into this and we beat up that guy and we steal mm. that thing and we and we can get to this thing and we can complete our mission. And he's pointing to like the big strategy board where mm. he's drawn out his entire strategy and he circles at the bottom. And if we're successful, we don't need a third act. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, just saying this is not going to work yeah. because we're going to have a third act in this movie. Otherwise, the movie would just end. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if it just ended? It's like 70 minutes long. Yeah. But uh, with a character like Deadpool, you don't necessarily need that emotional hook. You I think can, you need you can, something, but it doesn't need to uh, well, be that severe. You can you can just comment on the fact that this is a sequel. We don't need to do any of this. And we can just play with the fact that this movie can doesn't necessarily need a net. You can just play with a completely unraveled uh, collection of plot threads or, or, even, and, or and make a joke out of it. I, I think I, that would be hilarious. I think you need to have mm. some mm. heart to it, some sort of genuineness to mm. this. And that doesn't even need to be that direct. Like you could have even done like, Deadpool is a merry mischief maker. Maybe mm. he's got a little subplot about kids or whatever, blah. And then Cable is the heart of the story. Mm. He's the series one. He's a straight man. Yeah. He plays off of, like, Josh Brolin's really funny. Like, if you ever saw <laughs> Men in Men Black, Black 3, three yeah. <laughs> which I, you like more than I do, I mm. think it's okay. He is a brilliant straight man in that mm. movie. He's really great as like, a young he, Tommy Lee Jones. He out Tommy Lee Jones is Tommy Lee Jones. Which in is that movie. no easy feat. Mm. Um,. Okay, but you know what? Let's let's that really is kind of the downfall of the movie. But let's talk about the things we liked because mm. there's a lot of really good things in this movie. <laughs> um, 
the Deadpool assembles a team mm. uh, in this movie, and, and they, there are so many brilliant jokes that come out of that. Every single joke involving the Vanisher is a 10 out of 10. Ex- like every single time they mentioned it, referenced it, every single way that they played it, is he in the room? Is he not? Every single time fucking killed me. The, assembling the team was very, very Mystery Men. Oh, to yeah. Me. Like the. the just that scene in Mystery Men where they audition like the the Waffler and Pencilhead. Pencilhead is played by Doug Jones, by the way. Oh, yes. It wasn't uh, wasn't like there was like a Dane Cook was in there. Was Dane Cook the Waffler? Dane Cook was the Waffler. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who was the Waffler and also a Waffle Man? Like he couldn't decide on what his name was. Got it. Um, yeah, all of that was was really Mystery Men, and it, it all cul- the assembling of the team and like, them charging into action. This really fantastic skydiving sequence. Is oh my God. one of the best things in a superhero it's movie. Such a well thought yeah, out sequence. Yeah, yeah. Like everything in it really comes together um, perfectly. There's a character Domino whose uh, oh superpower is that she's lucky. Yeah, and, and they joke Deadpool about how that's not o- open, openly complains that's not very cinematic. Is and it? it turns out it's crazy cinematic. <laughs> it's really really great. Uh, Zazzy Beats. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Zazzy Beats. I think maybe. it's Zazzy, but yeah. She's great, mm. and I want her to have her own movie. Like she's yeah, really, 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 really fun. Like I really dig mm. her a lot. Um, I was a little, a little miffed that you know we, this, this first Deadpool came out. And it was the first one that was really kind of self aware about yeah. superhero tropes in a long, like since the late nineties. Yeah, we had Mystery Man, and, we had the specials, but and and then, that's been a while. And then it was all earnestness. Both of those are dreams. great superhero comedies. Absolutely, they are. Yeah. I, Mystery Men is, I, I talk about it every day, and you, I need to show up about it. You and I are, it, like, the yeah. biggest fans of that movie, <laughs> like, like, period. But I think the specials uh, is really underrated, too. But then they start talking about doing Deadpool 2, mm-hmm. and... Uh, f- First of all, I'm a little disheartened that they didn't call it like Deadpool colon Deadpooler. Or how did, you know. they, how did they not have mm. a joke in that title? Like, yeah, it's absurd. Mm. Like like Electric Boogaloo is a cliche. However, uh, there's a moratorium on Electric Boogaloo. However, the, the government any, put the kibosh on if that one. Any movie could have gotten away with an Electric Boogaloo. Mm. It's Deadpool. Now I know Electric Boogaloo isn't owned by Fox. Mm. What what the fuck is Universal or whatever studio it has doing with Breaking Two that they really want Electric Boogaloo that bad? They let a documentary be called Electric Boogaloo. Who gives a shit? Mm. I have been maintaining for a while mm. that I agree. The moratorium on calling every sequel Electric Boogaloo. Mm. It's been done to death. Yeah. I think we need you to can, replace it with the Deadly Art of Illusion deadly, or, or the Desolation of Smaug. I think both of those are okay. Deadpool: The Desolation of Smaug is a great title. <laughs> I think they just could have called it Deadpool: colon, Deadpool Two. That would that have been a great good. title. Uh, th- there's, there was just that meta quality, and that's why I like it so much. Was yeah. you know, heart. <laughs> I don't care. I, li- I like the, I like the meta quality. I like the deconstruction of it. And uh, when they started talking about Deadpool two, the conversations was, "Ooh, Domino is in it, and Cable is in it." It's like, no, that's the old conversation. That's what we have about like Infinity War and all those Avengers movies. You know, who's going to play what character? That's what you get excited about those other movies. This is something that's trying to take the piss out of that, and that they're just sort of bringing in these familiar characters and doing the usual stuff with them mm-hmm. was also a little bit of a letdown. That being said, I, mm-hmm. I do want to say. There is one character, and I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't mm. think it's in much of the publicity. Mm. There's one character that has already been introduced in the X Men universe that mm. comes back. Yeah, and is fixed. Like is <laughs> well, works again. Like that, it actually they, is the better version. It is what they did with Deadpool. I mean, Deadpool yeah. did appear. Ryan Reynolds played that same character in X Men Origins Wolverine. A, yeah. A, a, a film I don't mind, and I know a lot of people hate. It's, um, you know what? I watched it again not too long ago. It like plays as like kind of like a movie. Mm-hmm. Like it has like pacing, and there are things that <laughs> I like and about characters. It. There's so many things about it that are just stupid and wrong mm-hmm. and make no sense, and yeah. it's frustrating. And they destroyed Deadpool. Like Deadpool sucks. Yeah, they, by they, the they, end of they, that. they altered it, and I think they didn't really. Yeah count on the fact that there are people out there who like knew the character and wanted him to be treated a certain way. The lack of care Mm. that Fox has taken with what, you know, is theoretically a shared universe that they have. Mm. Like the extent to which they don't give a shit Uh about things like continuity. Like there are like how many, there have been like four Emma Frosts in like different ages at different uh, timelines. There was like an Emma Frost in like 1981 and then, and, but she was a teenager, but then there was an Emma Frost and she was like in her thirties and the sixties make up your goddamn mind. Same with the, the, the Cyclops. Mm-hmm. Like he's a, he's in high school in 19, 
80, but then he's like only five years older, like in the like okay. 30 Here, years later. Yeah. Here's it's, the it's, thing. I know that like Wolverine changed the timeline in Days of Future Past, but here's what I don't understand. Mm-hmm. How does Wolverine changing the timeline in the 70s mm-hmm. make Angel <laughs> born 20 years earlier. <laughs> I don't get that yeah. at all. Like there's you know just, what? they the, do not give a shit. The, and sometimes I don't mind if it works, but mm. sometimes it's really distracting and dumb. The, the lack of continuity is something I kind of admire that they are really just sort of playing as they go rather than put it, but putting they, too much careful thought into it makes it boring to me. But my point is that sometimes I don't think they know what they have and they'll mm. take a character mm. who's really cool and they'll make them super lame. So you think they, they made a cool, cool character cool again yeah. after they had made him lame. I, Previously. I think they did, and okay. I admire that. All right. Um, yeah, listen, here's... We, we have and, and we're not saying what the character is, because it's a big reveal. It's, it's so, a yeah. thing. Like, here, here's what I'm going to say about Deadpool 2. Mm. Um, we have critiques, and I think they're legit critiques. Uh, that said, we both said at the beginning, it's fun. Oh, it's really... Hel- it's, like, yeah, it's, you'll it's have really a hilarious. good time watching it. There are two post-credit stingers that are my favorite thing. They're really funny. <laughs> There's some really and, funny and post-credit stingers. My, my, real, my real hope was that the whole movie would be stuff like that, but, you know... No, it, it, we'll listen, it's, it's a treat, but as a, it's, just, it's just one of those sequels that's just kind of too big for its britches, and honestly, I, it feels to me... Because mm-hmm. Deadpool had been, like, in development for a really long time, and it almost didn't get made. They had a lot of time to work on the first Deadpool mm. and get the story right. This feels a little a little haphazard and chaotic. Like they had a mm. bunch of good ideas, but they didn't really mold them into something that really mm. hit the way it needed to <laughs> hit all the time. Mm. But when it works, it works really, mm. really, really, really well. And yeah, um, I'm, I'm net picking, but yeah, I, I really did enjoy the movie. I, yeah, had, it's I fine. had a really great time. It's fun. I, I recommend it. Mm. Uh, but like, yeah, it didn't it didn't blow me away. Mm. Uh, okay, the next film we're going to be reviewing is. We didn't actually say what we're going to be reviewing. We're going to Deadpool two. No, we, t- we said Cargo and Fahrenheit and uh, uh, four fifty one. We 51. said okay. Yeah. Didn't <laughs> Let's talk about the new Netflix release. Cargo. Mm. What is Cargo? Cargo is an Australian zombie film. Although I didn't, I did no reading on this beforehand. Mm. I wanted to go in completely cold, uh, so I didn't know it was a zombie film at first. So oh. um, there's uh, Mar- Martin Freeman uh, is floating down a river on a boat with his wife and his child, who is like less than a year old. Yeah, a baby. Baby. He has a baby, yeah. and. We know something really horrible has happened to the world, and we know that you can be infected by something. And uh, when then they're hunting for supplies, people look at them suspiciously and caught guns in their presence. Everybody's mm. the the world is over. Civilization, as uh, we know, it is it, it is the post apocalypse. And uh, he looks for some supplies on a yacht. He gets some supplies, which is great because they're running really low on food. Uh, the wife goes out to look for some supplies, and she is bitten by yep. a thing. And uh, we realize that she has about 48 hours before she is infected. Before she is, well, before she like, is, succumbs, loses it. Yeah, succumbs, succumbs, yeah, succumbs to the, this infection. Yeah. And uh, it incubates for 48 hours. Yeah. So we get to see sort of the, the tragic tragedy of that time passing. It happens. They can't do anything to stop it. Uh, and when it happens, like this big, like crusty, scab like pustules form on her face it's really gross it's really gross it's very yeah. distinctive yeah yeah, yeah and, you've seen yeah, a lot of zombie like movies this, I haven't seen that it's like our orange glop just pours out of her face and crusts over immediately and she uh, goes nuts bites him and now he has 48 hours uh, this is kind of the premise of the movie he yeah. has 48 hours to find a home for his child before he too succumbs to the zombie virus I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it out there there's mm. a lot of zombie movies out there it's mm. hard to come up with a good idea for a new zombie movie it's true that this is a good idea it's a good idea it's it's, it's a really suspenseful setup I really like the premise it, it's novel for a, a genre that has pretty much explored almost anything that can be done you'd with zombies. think but apparently not mm. every once in a while someone comes up with a um, new one the problem is they're in the Australian outback. A, a everybody's laid back. I mean, this is the country that invented the phrase "no worries," and uh, so yeah, it, there, there's not a lot of like panic, and there's not a lot of people. So he just kind of has to wander, panicking that he might eat his own baby at some point. And, and, and I'm going to throw it out there: Martin Freeman, really talented actor. Very, I really like yeah. him a lot, but he is so affable, <laughs> and you, you, he brings this inherent sympathy. With he's, him. he's kind of like a sitcom dad in this movie. He is. That's kind of the problem. Like you, you, you cast Martin Freeman, and you think, mm-hmm. well, I'm going to be sympathetic with this character no matter what happens. But I don't know how much of it is the acting or the directing or the, just the editing. But like he. 
after this horrible thing happens and he is a ticking clock, he has a countdown on his wrist. Mm. And it's all about finding his baby, like a place to live and hopefully a future. Mm. Um, a lot of scenes, like he's not, doesn't seem to be that panicked or in a rush. And it kind of really injures mm. the suspense and the pacing. This is, a, this is too slowly paced for the narrative that it is mm. trying to sell us and the intensity that it keeps trying to insist that it has mm. with various lines of dialogue, with mm. scenes of him, like, you know, doing everything he can to save his daughter that are then interspersed with pretty laid back walking sequences. Yeah. So they just don't have that, that verve, that electricity yeah. that this kind of needs, or at least like a ramping up. Like a sense of increasing desperation yeah. as time goes by. As well, he as runs into someone, oh, this person would be perfect. Oh, wait, no, they're not. They're yeah. horrible. And yeah. you got to move on. And that would only make it worse. And it's like, what am I going to do? And it's it sucks. And, and it, it's a sucky situation. I'm it, the movie it's, sucks. It's, it's a sucky situation. Suck. And, and yeah, for the setup that sort of demands that sort of frantic increasing of, of, uh, of panic, mm. um, it does lack that. It's it's a little too laid back for its own good in that regard. But watching Martin Freeman kind of slowly go mad and some of the horrible things that happen in front of this poor baby, uh, really, that's what really started to make me panic. Like, well, you're there's, a dad. Also, I'm a, I'm a dad, happens, yeah. and when a, a dad is slowly turning to a zombie, I'm deathly afraid that he's going to start eating that baby at any minute, and mm. that would freak me the hell out. So I was frightened by the movie, despite the lack of pan like just bare panic. Mm -hmm. And there are some really great innovative things. Um, there's a, a relationship he makes with a young uh, a young girl whose father has recently also succumbed. Yeah. And there, the, the notion of the, in most zombie movies is, you know, how much is the zombie still the person that used to be? And there's always that one asshole in every zombie movie who thinks, no, 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 they can be saved. No, they can't. They can't. This is a zombie movie. Just take their head off. Just do it. Mm. Yeah, splatter them. Do what you need to do. And, uh, this movie plays with that. It, play, it, plays, like. it plays with that a little bit and, you know, deals with, how much hope there might be in this scenario. Yeah, there's things I really like in this movie. Uh, I like and, and um, th that relationship and the sort of bringing up the these notions of fatherhood and who's going to care for what and you know who has th these responsibilities. I think are strong enough that the lack of panic is is not so big an issue. Well, I think uh, uh, there are, as I said there are things I really like about this mm. movie. One of the things that is every zombie movie tends to have. Mm. Um, is not just a story about the dead coming back to life, but a story about the downfall of particularly Western civilization. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think about it, a contemporary society in which we live is pretty far removed from our agrarian roots as mm. animals. Yeah. Uh, cave people, if you must. Um, and well, well, we were cave people by the time we get to the agrarian. Phase, you know what I mean, but, though, yeah. like before, like a proper society when the populations mm. were lower and people didn't depend on other people yeah. for goods and services. Um, and there was a lot more paranoia, like, you know, th basically we have an illusion of society that we have all agreed to share. Yeah. And all it takes is something horrible to break it. And that's <laughs> one of the reasons why the zombie movie, the zombie premise is mm -hmm. so pervasive is because that's something we kind of innately know Yeah, that there's, we're only well, we're so many steps. We're walking removed. on a thread here. Yeah. I would love to see a zombie outbreak movie that takes place like during agrarian times and they just know how, what to do. Well, uh, like, <laughs> just, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Has that oh. kind of quality, doesn't it? I, I suppose. I mean, that's the you know much much later. I, yeah. you know, I'm talking about like you know, but like when it has that years it has earlier. That, it has yeah. that like peaceful, just sort of oh the, oh they're in the distance because mm. we're very we everyone lives very far away. Doesn't have that weird weird. Pride and Prejudice vibe. and Zombies has a lot of great Pride and Prejudice stuff. Like it all really the Jane is. Austen stuff is really great. The <laughs> zombie stuff sucks. I know. It's so like then they use like CGI zombies that even look bad, and then there's. I'm totally with so you on all of this. This war that's going on, like, outside a wall that surrounds their city. It's all so stupid. It, it doesn't work. Um, but, edit out the zombie stuff. You got a good Jane Austen film. But in Cargo, there's a story about how, like, all of, like, the young people in particular mm. have are surviving by, like, going back 
to pre-Western civilization mm. and just living in the woods and like not having this sort of and we'll build a fort. Well, that's just a target. We'll live <laughs> in the woods, and you know they're 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 adapting. They're adapting mm. to the future. And Martin Freeman's character, he's um he's trying to save his daughter with. In, in in ways that make sense to him in like civilization. Here's a man and a woman and they have a family unit. Mm. Therefore they are the best. No. Not necessarily. <laughs> no, is, not but, anymore. He, yeah. He's not adapting. The movie ends in a very particular and very wonderful way. Um that's really, really cool. And I but you, here's using a, zombies in an innovative fashion. But here's what I'm gonna say. Cargo mm. is actually an adaptation of a short film. Would have played better as a short film. It, and it does. Mm. Uh, you can see the short film online. It's got like 14 million views. It's very popular. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's called Cargo. You can see it on YouTube. It's like from like five years ago or something now, like 2013. Right. Um, and it's basically the movie in under 10 minutes. The short film is fantastic. Like it's <laughs> really great. And I would highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's good storytelling. Um the suspense is really, really palpable in a way that Cargo, the feature, never quite attains. It's made by the same people. But I just think in padding it out, mm. they kind of lost focus. I, I can see that. I can, but, I, can, I can understand it. But Cargo is not a bad movie. It just mm. didn't really do much for me. And, yeah, I, right. and ultimately, I think it's probably a lot longer than it needed to be in order mm. to sell itself. I think what you have here is a story with a ticking clock, and then they forget that they have a clock. Mm. And like He's not constantly checking his yeah, watch. This, just... You've seen a movie in which, like, you know, we only have 48 hours to do thing. Mm. And you know that when you have that premise, you know that tension is going to mount because... You know, you're not going to do it right away. <laughs> you got to have the whole movie to go yeah, through. It's like, the e easiest plot contrivance in the world, but it's and, and, and it always effective. works. Yeah, yeah it always works. It always, it's like That's why um, Angels and Demons was better than the Da Vinci Code because they added a ticking clock. Yeah, they didn't have one in the Da Vinci Code, so nobody cared. It's equally dumb, but the pacing is better. Yeah. Like, and Cargo <laughs> manages to have that plot device and still kind of wonk mm. up the play, the pacing. So, I'm not a big big mm. fan of that. But uh, tell me about Fahrenheit 451. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 is uh, now on um, HBO. Yes. Uh, just, just debuted on HBO. Uh, it is the third film adaptation of Ray Bradbury's book. Is it? Um, I think there was a TV movie in there. So uh, French, Francois Truffaut made a really terrific version of it in, in the 1970s. With, I think terrific is a slight exaggeration. Uh, I like it. I, I like it fine. I think. It's, I think. I think. I think it kind of peters out at the end. I like think it just it, sort of unravels. And I think dies. the sci-fi stuff gets away from him. Francois mm. Truffaut was not like a high concept to director most mm. of the time. He tended to focus on characters and stuff like that. So when you finally like put it, give him a situation where like, oh, you're making a sci-fi movie. He's like, oh, I'm going to make a scene with jetpacks. And you're just looking at it like, this is absurd. Yeah, well, and, we didn't and, need and jetpacks. Well, I don't even think it was in the novel. I don't know why he had them. I think maybe they were in the novel. There are only a, a few shots of the jetpacks. Yeah, yeah, they but look they really... But they stick out. And it's just like, it seems like have, he's trying to be like a Hollywood movie maker. Yeah, and it just doesn't We work. have the main character coming home to Julie Christie. And, you know, this is taken from the book. Uh, in, it's the future. Nobody reads anymore. Everybody does, just watches TV. And all of their walls have essentially been converted into giant TV screens. And they're all on drugs. Just to, to deaden all of their senses. And, you know, Guy Montag wanders in and Julie Christie is like laid out on a couch looking great in this like polyester 70s pants suit and just mm. looks up and says, we need more screens. That kind of stuff is really great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think but, there was a TV movie uh, mm. at some point in there, and this is the first adaptation in a while. Um, it's been a long, long while. There were many attempts, mm -hmm. like throughout the 90s and the 2000s, like big, big people really wanted to make a Fahrenheit 451 yeah. story. And the story of Fahrenheit 451 is that in this dystopian future mm. where people are placated by brainless entertainment, uh, there is a very important job working for the government. Mm. Uh, you're a fireman. You're a fireman. That doesn't mean you fight fires. It means you burn things that make people think, mm. particularly books. Fahrenheit 451 is the, the temperature at which books burn. Yeah. Um, Ray Bradbury, what, what I, I think I like about Fahrenheit 451, the novel, uh, over some of the other dystopian novels that it's usually compared to, like 1984, is that the government has not imposed this 
Uh, this mm-hmm. is just people are sort very of complicit in it, it. yeah. It's just a, a result of what happened when people uh, decided they wanted society to be easier and dumber. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pace had to be faster. There's a talk in the book, and this is ridiculous now, but how billboards had to get like bigger and longer because people wanted to drive faster. So you had to make big billboards like even larger, so the the advertising could constantly be in people's eyes. So there's billboards everywhere. Nobody reads books anymore. In fact, they're burnt. And uh, Guy Montag, the main character, decides to stop taking his mood-deadening drugs and finds some books that are kind of interesting and falls in with this underground of novel-hoarding uh, outlaws, essentially. Uh, it's great. It's one of the great dystopian novels. Mm-hmm. It's uh, fantastic. Yeah, I highly recommend it. This is set... Uh, Right now is a really, really important time to have Fahrenheit 451, and especially the way they tell it in this HBO movie. Because we live in this... It's, things have only gotten faster since Ray Bradbury wrote it, mm-hmm. and it's become, and if, with each passing year, it becomes more and more relevant. People are more entertained. We may not... We have wall-sized television screens in many mm-hmm. households, but we also make sure we have a TV screen on us at literally all times. Uh, at all times. We have to have and a TV screen on us. And we're constantly looking at it. And... We, we, the, we elected a reality show host president. Yeah, in, in, in the Trump era, and I'm going to get political AF right now. Well, yeah, it's it, a political story. There, it's a very political story, and this new film plays with that very, very well, because the reason we're burning books is because we don't want any sort of conflict of ideas, these things that make us think. And there's a lot of time. Michael Shannon plays uh, Guy Montag's boss. Guy Montag is played by Michael B. Jordan in this version. Oh, okay. and, that's uh, a really good cast. That's a really good cast. And uh, uh, this is from the director of 99 Homes. So he's worked with Michael, uh, Michael Shannon before. Right. Uh, he talks about how the history of literature is just a history of disagreement and conflict. And, you know, somebody writes a philosophy and somebody writes another philosophy and you read these things. And the presumption that he's making is that people aren't smart enough to suss out which of these is true or which of these is applicable to life or which of these feels more like their own internalized philosophy. All they see is an argument and all it's going to lead to is conflict and bickering. So this is modern day Twitter. (laughs) They don't use the word Twitter, but they call about they talk about the nine, which is their nickname for the the future Internet. Mm. And people do still use words, but it's mostly been reduced to like little tiny bits of words, little titles, little iconography emojis, Mm -hmm. essentially. All all communication can now be reduced to emojis and everything is like you're a big reality star. Yeah. So burning books and talking about the way ideas need to be simplified to make sure there is peace is an unbelievably salient to the way, you, you know, in the era of fake news. This is what mm-hmm. Donald Trump has used. He's weaponized it to rally a really simplified version of political discourse. Yeah, wherein we're right, mm-hmm. and anyone who is wrong, anyone who disagrees with us, is inherently is, wrong, the, the, is inherently biased, mm-hmm. is lying intentionally, yeah, yeah, yeah. is completely misled. Mm-hmm. There's no conceivable way they have a cogent argument. And this is kind the, of like I mean, that's, this is kind of the flaw in you know sort of a, a lot of online discourse in particular. I think if you have actual in one-on-one discourse, this might not be as applicable. But we keep presenting arguments to one another, thinking eventually we'll find a middle ground. But really, we just there's a lot of yeah. just people wanting to just push everyone into their way of thinking, well, and, and, and some ways of thinking you can, are very wrong. Some ways of thinking are debatable. Mm. Some ways of thinking, I think, well, are rather objectively moral, but whatever, the, that's up for debate. There's this really toxic uh, way of <laughs> My thinking. My objectivity and, is up for debate. Well, th- this is, and this is from whatever side of the political spectrum you are, you know, whether you, everybody thinks they're reasonable, first of all. Mm-hmm. You can go online and find that echo chamber and convince yourself you're reasonable because you found others that validate your opinion, and now everybody else is wrong. And Basically. In the future of this version of uh, Fahrenheit uh, 451, it takes place after Civil War II. The Civil War happened because of that kind of conflict. Everything's getting rebooted so, these er- days. Everything's getting rebooted, but so, yeah, Civil War II, the result of essentially Trumpian politics. So this is the post-Trump Civil War version of mm-hmm. Fahrenheit 451. And, and apparently we've decided that the mm-hmm. problem wasn't 
the the issue that we disagreed with the the, the issue was we disagreed yeah yeah and, and so therefore keep everyone placated and mindless yeah and yeah so the an extreme form of this has won out now all of the all forms anything that to to encourage thought here's uh, the problem destroyed. uh fahrenheit 451 yeah. was very tech based hmm. burning books uh now we have new technology to pass on that information so in addition to burning like physical pages they're also like smashing databases and stuff yeah and and the new twist, and they have to alter a lot in the actual novel to sort of make sure the tech is updated, passing on this information in different sorts of ways as part of the plot. And there's a big plot point where they talk about passing on information that's encoded inside DNA. <gasps> Johnny and, Mnemonic. Yeah, it's kind of like a Johnny Mnemonic thing, which means they found a way to pass on books hidden inside living beings. And... You would think that the movie would go a little bit further and they'd start burning people because they contain information. And that would be, you know, a really great, yeah, makes a sense. Really horrific symbol. It doesn't go quite to that extreme, unfortunately. Well, here's my question here, because mm. the, the issue with Fahrenheit 451 and a lot of other dystopian fiction mm. is that um, they introduce a world and it's interesting to live in it and it's horrifying. And we all think to ourselves, oh, God, how can we fix this? Mm. How can we prevent this? They often tend to get a little preachy after a while. They kind of have to by necessity. Kind of, they're, but they're they, taking... you, you can do it badly. Mm. Does this new adaptation do it well? I think it does. I, I know a lot of people actually haven't been liking this rendition. I think it's actually incredibly effective. I like the way they kind of ratchet up the action and the tragedy. Mm. Uh, Michael B. Jordan finds a, a big treasure trove of books. And of course he sneaks the one most appropriate novel off of the top. It's Dostoevsky's notes from underground. Uh -huh. he, he couldn't grab like, you know, something completely fluffy, like, well, you know, eat, pray, love. Well, off of if the you top. do that, it's really weird. Like if you look at the, uh, the Francois Truffaut version, mm -hmm. uh, but the end of the movie, he falls in with a group of people who are trying to memorize all these books, which is, which is also up. in this version. Yeah, it's in the yeah. book. And, um, in the movie, Mm. They decide that the book that he will memorize and he will protect for everyone mm. is the collected works of Edgar Allan Poe. And mm. you're just sort of like, okay, well, why I, that one? I, yeah. I'm glad I love Edgar Allan Poe, but is there a reason? Like the fact that it wasn't thematically resonant was also distracting. Well, so, I suppose you just, so you just got to pick your battles, yeah. I guess. Um. Yeah, he falls in with these people who who have to memorize books. Uh, one of the represented mostly throughout the movie by uh, Sophia Butella, uh, the mummy. Oh, yeah, she, yeah. She's in, she plays like an informant who she's, is also part of this underground. She's really great, and mm -hmm. I keep waiting for her to get a meaty role. Is this a good role yeah, for her? Like, uh, sadly, no. She's <sighs> she's just a supporting character. Damn it. Um, I mean, the mummy was in theory the meaty role that was supposed to do it for her, but you know that in was actuality, no. such a lousy flick that nobody cared. Uh, yeah, so she she's good in the scenes she's in, and there are some really great scenes of them reading uh, notes from underground together. Um, mm. If you are well read, Fahrenheit four fifty one makes your heart break. Yeah, uh, just watching your favorite books just go up in flames is it's painful to watch, and something this version of the film doesn't explicitly address but has always been part of Fahrenheit 451 is the wave of anti-intellectualism that sort of permeates a lot of culture and I feel like we're mm. at a height of that right now not just with the Trumpian politics but with the way we consume a lot of our pop media uh, you go online a lot of the uh, discourse is surrounding just a few big not incredibly complicated pop feature films or video games or you know music or what, music yeah. whatever it is there are exceptions and to that there there are of course exceptions to this and there's you know great arts writing being done all the time and there are people who are devoting themselves to the western canon of literature but i feel like more than ever it's a part of our culture that we're kind of trying to deliberately eschew there's a there's a movement toward a simple pleasure and how the simple mm -hmm. pleasure is being argued more and more as the superior one. Why can't you just turn off your brain and enjoy the movie? Or, or, or you know, that if it can be enjoyed, it's just as legit as great art. No, and, that's and not that, necessarily that's necessarily the case. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things with that. I think one, uh, the education system uh, mm -hmm. in America um, started to skew towards test scores as opposed to mm -hmm. actual comprehension of material and 
As a result, a lot of people are taught in school how to take a test, mm. not necessarily how to think for so themselves. It's all standardized rather than yeah. you know, act, you know, actual teaching. Mm-hmm. Because uh, schools are judged based on how they do on those tests. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's a bad system, and as that as a result of that and a lot of other things, reading comprehension, mm. I think is is in, De- definitely at, down. I would say it's at risk. Let's there say like, let's, let's say that like, yeah, down teetering. is accusatory. At risk is is something mm. we need to be concerned about. And I think the other issue is that the dominant media that people were absorbing mm. uh, shifted away from the written word, uh, and there was a lot of. You know, sort of, there was this dead patch where a lot of people weren't being taught at a young age how to disseminate mixed media, how to Mm. disseminate uh, the news or movies or television. And as a result, there's a lot of people who aren't like, you know, you're taught in school, like, here's subtext in a novel. You're not necessarily taught subtext in movies or or, or, the, to, to or, question, the, or the news media yeah, or yeah. to question you know what you're actually seeing and, mm-hmm. and understand the various ins and outs of how what you are seeing is only part of an issue in the news because mm-hmm. you know there's selective editing and as a result i think Fahrenheit 451 is mm-hmm. incredibly relevant and salient i didn't see this okay uh, i well, will recommend the- my my personal favorite adaptation of Fahrenheit 451 which is of course Kurt Vimmer's Equilibrium <laughs> I knew you were going to bring up Equilibrium. I like Equilibrium. I like Equilibrium, too. It's, Equilibrium it's the is, schlock version of Fahrenheit 451. Equilibrium is Fahrenheit 451 meets The Matrix. If mm. you were just like, I like Fahrenheit 451, but, but I want them to actually do a martial art with pistols called Gun Kata. <laughs> they, they made up a gun-based martial art for the movie. Yeah, and you want to see, like, Remember Christian, all those other movies? It caught on real well. Yeah, Christian Bale kata. will Gun Kata you. Alan, so will Tay Diggs. <laughs> Equilibrium is a lot of fun. It's it's it's, it's kind of it's got the a dumber re- version of this, but it's, it's really fun. It, it, it's fun. It's a dumbed down version. It, everybody takes you know mood dampening drugs in the future. But it's and, got a great cast: Emily Watson and Sean Bean. Like it's a good cast in that movie. It's nuts. Um, is that the one where they fight with flaming swords, or am I thinking of Ultraviolet? Again? I think I think of Ultraviolet, which okay. is the other Kurt Vammer movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a good movie. Ultraviolet sucks. <laughs> Ultraviolet's really bad. I don't know why Ultraviolet is in my mind. It shouldn't be. It should be know. gone by now, but should I still, been, should still have remember been it. been folded into like the Resident Evil yeah. universe. Yeah, yeah. Ul- Just sort of like this alternate dream that Alice had. Although, here's something that's really curious about the crossed wires that are, are malfunctioning in my brain. Whenever I think of the movie Serenity, I only picture scenes from Ultraviolet. <laughs> I, I don't know why those two they films kind of la- no, not each at other. all. all but right. yeah, like, is that the scene where they have they hide the swords in their body in Serenity? No, that's Ultraviolet. But the other sword fight, that's ultra also Ultraviolet. <laughs> I remember nothing about the movie Serenity. It's just it's just, just Ultraviolet. U- ultraviolet somehow laid on top of it and just completely smothered it. It's really weird. I, I can't explain it. I don't all know right. why. Uh, let's run through the week's uh, new releases that we saw. I didn't get to see Book Club. I really wanted to. I'm sorry. I know yeah, you were excited. I, I wanted to see Book. Club too. Um, all right, so let's run down. Uh, the critically acclaimed scale goes from C minus, which is the worst grade a movie can get, to C plus, which is the best grade a movie can get, and then right in the middle is a C. <laughs> C is <laughs> C is fine, fair. All right, Deadpool two. Deadpool two, uh, a high C. Doesn't doesn't. Qu- there are a few moments that like really kind of pushed it into C plus territory, mm-hmm. but ultimately it's it's passable more than it is great. I'm gonna I, I would not say it's great, however, I would say it's so funny it's, it's that hilarious. I'm, that I'm yeah. willing to forgive a lot of its narrative flaws and so yeah. I'll say it's a low C plus. Okay. I recommend it. Yeah, me too. But it's got actual problems that we need to talk about. Uh cargo? Cargo is a C. Yeah, right but, in the middle. Yeah, it it, it no it, it it's never insufferable, but it, it doesn't Mm-hmm. It, elate me. Yeah, it's it's just it's just it's a good story with pacing problems. That's mm-hmm. all it boils down to, and mm-hmm. it just boils down to a C. And then Fahrenheit four fifty one. Uh, I give it a C plus. Okay. I, I know I'm in the minority on that you one, are. but I, I think it's it's a really terrific film. I think it's important that people understand this story and for god's sake read the western canon <laughs> there's a reason they're in the western canon those are the best books ever written and you know what else is in the western canon hmm. green lantern green lantern is most certainly in the western canon okay so schmoville schmo fans schmoes hmm. and listeners of the critically acclaimed if you choose not to take any of those labels you had the option you had the option to force us to review spawn howard the duck and green lantern and you chose green lantern 
interesting choice. Why? Why? Well, I th- it's a well, Ryan Reynolds movie. Let's a, be honest here. It's, it's a Ryan Reynolds it, it movie. It kind of writes itself. I think more people saw this one than saw the other two. You so know, it, they're it, really. It, it made money. Like, it wasn't like a total bomb. It just wasn't what the studio needed it to be. And, and it wasn't what. Like, it's it, one of those films that had fans reacted to it differently then mm-hmm. the landscape would be different but you know yeah if it had been a hit like we would have had a very different looking dc extended yeah. universe this is like the dracula untold of dc movies <laughs> where, where they were like at, trying to start something this was going to be the first it was going to be in, I, in a new line yeah. of superhero movies of an interconnected superhero universe supposedly but it wasn't a hit so they abandoned it mm-hmm. the same thing with dracula untold that was going to be the start of the universal monsters like interconnected universe and then they were like oh it sucked and no one liked it and didn't make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. The mummy it is. Uh, and I'll say this, Dracula Untold, far worse than the mummy. <laughs> the, mummy yes. has, the mummy has stuff, in, at least stuff in it the that I like. The mummy was salvageable. Yeah. Like if they had continued after the mummy, I would have said like, okay, th- I'm not going to write off the entire quote unquote dark universe yet. Yeah. Dracula Untold is pretty funny. Dracula Untold is it's, 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 it's <laughs> a really bad watchable. Movie. It's just stupid. It's a stupid really film. bad motion picture. Um, and so, I got to watch them film it. I know. I got, I got to go to Ireland and watch them film that one. So uh, Greenlander came out in 2011. It was directed by Martin Campbell, who, who had, is a very good director well, outside of the. Okay, he does. He's really hit or miss. Unbel- he's 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 done two of the best James Bond movies. Uh, yeah, he did Goldeneye and Casino Royale. Yeah. Uh, I love Goldeneye. I think that's my favorite one. Uh, Casino uh, Royale is my favorite. All right. Down. So yeah. Uh, he did The Mask of Zorro. Yep. Uh, he did. Uh, Which is another one of the best superhero movies. People mm-hmm. do not talk about Zorro mm-hmm. as if it's like a superhero movie. He's basically Batman. He kind of <laughs> started the idea of the superhero as mm-hmm. we know it in the 20th century. Uh-huh. Like those. Him, the, him the, and the Scarlet Pimpernel. They, yeah, uh, but like Scarlet Pimpernel was like before. Like Zorro in like the silent era was like the first like mm-hmm. huge pop. <laughs> superhero and there's a reason why so many Batman stories begin with him going to see Zorro it's not a coincidence mm. Mask of Zorro I hands down one of the best quote unquote superhero movies I love well, one, of, one of the better action movies of, of the 90s Damn anyway right. yeah. I really like um, the movie a lot and it's amazing also, to me he also did Legend of Zorro which is one of the worst uh, things which I did not see and I heard it's nothing but bad things almost about almost unwatchable I'm amazed it's the same filmmaker I'm mm. amazed it doesn't make any sense that would be like if you found out mm. that like um, God, I'm trying to think. Like of like what, what? That would be like if you found out that Steven Spielberg directed Jaws: The Revenge. You'd be like, <laughs> what? How? How did he do that? But you're right. He, he, he. I think he also did that film Vertical Limit, which I thought was decent enough. Like, um, he did No Escape, which I think is a fun no. little B sci-fi picture. But uh, yeah, so he they brought him in to do Green Lantern. So here's this guy. He's had hit blockbustery mm. franchise movies before, and I think the big problem is his wheelhouse mm. was relatively grounded. You know, yeah. Zorro is a guy in a mask who fights people with a sword. Mm. Uh, no Escape is about people stranded on an island. Vertical Limit is about mountain climbers. Green Lantern is one of the high weird, fantasy. Yeah. It's one of the, it's not just high fantasy because high fantasy can be relatively straightforward. When I say Here's high, a knight and he's going off to fight a dragon. Maybe when I Here's say, a uh, space wizard with a laser sword. Green Lantern is so particular. <laughs> it's so very specific. And, and very strange and, and that you need someone and bug nuts who gets it crazy as well. Um, you need someone who understands not just the material, but how to make this very weird thing seem relatable and human. Well, and just and they never crack. And into just this movie. not bug nuts. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen this movie twice, and as I've, have I. I've looked at Green Lantern, you know, wiki pages and all mm-hmm. the rest, and. I just I'm I have so much trouble just wrapping my head around the the myth behind Green Lantern. Okay. Now, what you, what, to, what's your problem? To, well, it's just it's just such a strange idea. Um, now, 
Green Lantern originated as something different. It wasn't okay. he wasn't like a supernatural space cop with magic powers. He was like more like a haunted figure. Okay, like he'd I, stalk through I, I'm gonna just for the yeah. sake of yeah. clarity rather than hearing you muddle through this, I'm just gonna give everyone the quick rundown. Right. Green Lantern was created more or less contemporaneously with yeah. um is that the right word? Contemporaneously? Uh, um at, at the same time. Yeah. Uh around the same era as mm-hmm. Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman, but the original version of Green Lantern was more supernatural based. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was more ghostly. Yeah, and in the 1950s, DC decided to reboot their superhero line. And they decided to do new versions of many of their characters. Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman would remain the same, but the Flash would be a new guy. Mm. And the Flash actually ended up getting super speed powers and then naming himself after his favorite comic book character, the Flash. Uh huh. And then that's, that was that's, a huge. That's when they give him the red spandex yeah. suit. Yeah, yeah. And that was and that was a huge hit, and that that sparked what we call the Silver Age of comics. Um, and uh, they decided to do that with some of their other characters, and decided to do it with Green Lantern. And they decided to give Green Lantern an overhaul, a sci-fi overhaul this mm. time. So now, and I don't know the story of how they came up with this. Well, I said high fantasy. I'm guessing mm. they were. They might have been uh, very, high, high. very high when they were uh, coming up with it. Basically. Mm. The Green Lantern is a space cop. Okay. The idea is that uh, there is an intergalactic space force, and in order to protect the galaxy from various space criminals, tyrannical despots, all powerful mm. supernat- you know, supernatural sci fi beings, uh, they need a really, really powerful weapon. So they have a ring. And that mm-hmm. ring turns whatever they think into a reality, into a physical form. Mm. Uh, they that think that of a, is green. Freak, yeah, it's green. And mm. the idea is that it's run, because it's all in your mind, it's run on your willpower. It's got to run on some sort of mental force. A, so a, it's will, your strength a, of will, your strength of purpose. But in, in the movie, and, I'm not sure, and in the comics as well, willpower, it, it doesn't just... Like your powers don't just come from your will; it's also like a physical form of measurable energy. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like it, electricity. It, it's like it's like it's funneling we'll, through the ring, and uh, the ring is putting it out in like this mm. new sort of form. It's like a, it's almost like you're pushing it out, like pushing out a bubble, mm. like through like a film. Mm. Um, now, for whatever reason, when concentrated willpower takes physical form, it's great. It's the color green. It just happens to be green. Mm. That's that's the way it is. And, and then it turns out that there are other, and as we found out later on, there are other uh, weapons throughout the universe that turn other emotions, other like psychological forces into constructs as well, and they take different colors. Mm. So if you have a fear-based ring, which is something they were leaning towards in the future of Green Lantern, um, like that was totally going to be the sequel, mm. um, it would be yellow. And, and, for example, uh, and the Green Lantern's uh, arch nemesis, from what I remember from the Super Friends cartoon, was the Yellow Lantern. Yeah, a uh, Sinestro, uh, who started off as the greatest of all Green Lanterns, and then became corrupted mm. and became a bad guy. And that's something that they don't do in this movie, but they were heading towards it, and that's clearly what the sequel is going to go. The cartoons taught me that the Green Lantern was like his one weakness was anything that was the color yellow. Yeah. Like if he touched something that was yellow, he would he wouldn't have the same powers. Uh, yeah. That's really silly. <laughs> it's very silly, and it comes from this era of comics in which kind of characters needed clearly defined weaknesses considering how powerful they were. Yeah. Um, Green Lantern has basically godlike powers with that ring. If you think about it, there's very little he can't do. Mm. So they have to come up with something pretty straightforward for him to be weak against. Um, it's the reason why Superman they invented Kryptonite for Superman, for example. Mm. He needs something to sort of neutralize him a little bit. Make make it hard. How do we make it hard for him? <laughs> Damn it, the car is yellow. What do I do? Um, they decided later on, and a lot of this was spearheaded by a writer named Jeff Johns, who really turned the whole Green Lantern comic book around in like mm. the 2000s. He decided, or maybe it was decided earlier than that, but basically the idea is if fear is the enemy of willpower. Mm. You're afraid of something, you lose your willpower, you lose your nerve. Um, and a yellow lantern is the enemy of the green lantern, and yellow is the power of that. Um, that, that is uh, sort of more symbolic than anything else, and that is a flaw in the, in the ring itself, and that mm. it can be overcome oh. by, by not just... And they talk about this a little bit in the movie, and they don't really sell it very well. Originally, the idea was you have to be fearless. You have no fear. Mm-hmm. 
But really what's more important is overcoming fear. That's actually a better message. Yeah. Than just being cavalier and reckless. Well, it, and I feel like this movie doesn't really address that. Like the, they mm. say, the the best way to uh, to express your courage is to admit that you're kind of afraid a little bit, and mm-hmm. that makes you more courageous. Which is circular thinking in a, in a way. But here's here's the problem. I think one of the many problems with Green Lantern, and just it's like fundamentals. You can talk. You can nitpick the individual scenes all you want, but just the fundamentally, they kind of they kind of whiffed the whole thing. The idea of the Green Lantern character, as mm-hmm. we see in this movie, and there are many characters who have been the Green Lantern over the years. They focus on Hal Jordan, who is the Silver Age Green Lantern, and is considered the most popular version mm-hmm. by many people. Hal Jordan was a test pilot in the uh, sort of the right stuff mm. kind of mold. Uh, they were very uh, big, you know, sort of American heroes in the mm. 1950s and the 60s. Mer- the, and the Mercury 7. Watch the right stuff. A great movie. Mm. And uh, the idea was that was that was heroism, but it was also came with it a kind of recklessness, a kind of I'm willing to put myself in danger in order to do something great. And that's Hal Jordan. Ryan Reynolds plays that. I buy that. I buy him as reckless. Mm. They keep trying to sell us on this dramatic idea that he is actually, like, afraid of something. And they give him this backstory where his dad died in a plane crash. Mm. And then early on, he, like, cr- crashes a plane because... Or almost crashes a plane because he, 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 he like... He has, has a like, flashback and he panics. Yeah. They never say what he's afraid of. And frankly, it's hard to intu- it's hard to interpret. Uh, well, what is he afraid of? Like, what is his shtick? He's afraid it just seems of, like they gave him a random backstory. He's, he's afraid of dying in a plane crash like his dad. But he doesn't seem to be. No, no, no. It's well, not. Nothing actually. It doesn't track. There's nothing like. There's no like emotional. Mm. Actual, because like one of the things they tell you in writing classes, if you take like a creative writing class or a mm. screenwriting class, when they talk to you about like how to develop characters, one of the things they talk about <clears throat> is you should know what they want. You should know what they love. You should also know what they are afraid of. Mm-hmm. And the first time someone told me this when I was taking a writing class, my first thought was, oh, um, they're afraid of spiders. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was, that was where my mind went. Like, right. no. Mm-hmm. They're afraid of... Failure. Failure. Or, yeah, or not living yeah. up to their parents. Or mm-hmm. going to hell. Like, there's some, like, motivational... Spite or spiders or spiders. <laughs> like there's something like we all live in fear of something. We live in fear of um, dying alone or um, not being loved or something. And maybe it's not like this all-consuming, you know, thing that leaves us weeping in a corner every night. But it's something that drives us to action. <clears throat> there's no. Yeah, there's well, no clarity about what Hal Jordan the, is afraid of, and that's the point of the movie is him overcoming his fear. So yeah, the the premise of the movie is <coughs> uh, one of these space cops crash lands on Earth mm-hmm. um, after doing battle with an evil yellow space cloud called uh, Parallax. Yeah, uh, Parallax is now drifting towards Earth. Uh, big giant, big green rise in the silver surface yeah. space cloud. Yeah, yeah. and it's and, it, and it's Clancy Brown's CGI face in the middle of it. Um, Crash lands on Earth right in front of Hal Jordan, uh, and it's wearing a magic ring, and the magic ring knows, like, who the next space cop is. Like, the closest yeah. brave hero that well, needs to attach itself to. The idea is every every sector of the galaxy mm. has a Green Lantern assigned to it, and when one dies, mm. the ring seeks out the closest yeah, and viable the, yeah, candidate. And the ring, like, flies off a finger and just, like, flies onto somebody else's finger. Yeah. And, and it gives you the Green Lantern power. And Hal Jordan is not necessarily the only viable candidate, but he is the closest. He's the closest one. And uh, so he gets a, a little bit of an expo dump from this uh, this. <coughs> dying purple alien he gets a a lantern which like battery charges the ring yep it's like a and, and it, it's a and power it's, battery and it, it looks like a lantern but it's just a power battery and it gives him his green lantern suit which in this version was like a cgi construct they didn't dress him in the outfit and the idea makes sense because mm. the idea is that it's a creation of like the energy of the ring mm. in practice it looks bad it looks kind of silly <coughs> it looks yeah. like he's a cutout like it never looks right especially mm. with the mask yeah they cgi on the mask as well so it's yeah. just like erasing a part of his face it's making him less he's more expressive with the deadpool mask which covers his whole face mm-hmm. than he is with this little thing that just covers like the area around his eyes. Yeah, it doesn't work. Um, he kind of has to figure out what this thing is. He's dealing with this nondescript fear, I guess. And the whole idea is that he's dealing with the idea that he still has fear. And in order to be an effective Green Lantern space cop, 
he has to essentially destroy that part of his brain that feels fear. Yeah, so after a little bit, he is dragged up to the planet Oa, mm. uh, where it's the headquarters of the Green Lantern Corps, and there he meets a bunch of characters who are familiar uh, mm. to fans of the comic. Uh, mm. All these, there, It's a bunch of CGI monsters, yeah. if you're not. <laughs> and I remember thinking it was really funny, the... Um, um, like the casting for all those characters was announced like a couple of weeks before the movie came out. Like they just like they animated it and they added in Jeffrey Rush later. Oh, okay. like, <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey it, Rush plays got? like this fish monster. Yeah. Now, this is such a complicated mythology. You had to take me through years of comics just to lay down the groundwork yeah. for this. And if you're familiar with the comics, it's going to be familiar to you. And the, mm-hmm. the, the way they throw all this information at you is going to be really natural if you're already a fan. If you're not, which I wasn't, it's going to seem like laying on your floor and just having a dump truck of insanity poured on your face. Because mm-hmm. this is weird shit. Yeah, this is like, you know, like the opening title scrawl of... Because I think a lot of people who watched it mm. were familiar, or at least passingly familiar with Green Lantern. It was, you know, four mm. fan persons. And yet... A successful superhero movie will be accessible to people who don't read the comics because, let's be honest here, compared to movies, comics don't sell as well. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of people who watch it who will only be familiar with it from the movie, at least at first. So it needs to be accessible to new people. Green Lantern does a piss poor job of this. You look at the opening title scrawl of Star Wars, they try to keep it pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah. They try to give you just a little bit, a couple of big names, here's some some vocabulary words you might want to know. But basically, war, mm. rebels, <laughs> Reb- good guys, bad guys. You understand it's and it's all told visually. Every single piece of exposition, like early mm. on, is like weird. It's not just like rebels, good guys, bad guys. It's energy of the universe, mm. and here they started this planet, and they divided the planet into sectors, and it's like it sounds okay to like super geeks, but in actuality, this is actually like really specific well, and mythology, th- and most of it doesn't end up being important. So it's not, at least in this movie, yeah. so it really doesn't matter. And it happens so quickly that watching it this time, I could only assume that presenting all this information is a test of the Green Lantern Corps on new inductees. <laughs> like, if if we can, like, just sort of whisk you off your home planet without any context and put you down in this big, rocky outcropping of CGI monsters and there's like intelligent wasps and giant toads and talking fish monsters. Mm -hmm. And they tell you you're a cop and you have to murder people that you haven't seen before. And we're going to teach you how to make chainsaws out of light and you don't lose your fucking mind. Then you're in like, like if if you're, if you're really strong enough to, to understand all that nonsense, I would be highly suspicious of anyone who took to that too easily. Actually. I think think that's the test. It's like, you accept this. Sure. You can, you can create guns out of nowhere and I'll go kill those guys. Okay. I'm in. Wait, wait a second. You make it sound like Green Lantern murders a lot of people. He does. But it it is the implication here. He is being basically drafted into an army randomly. Yeah. 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 And that's a lot. Now he is a pilot, but he's a test pilot pilot he's mm. not a soldier mm. he's not asked to kill anybody even like they see like an aerial dogfight where he's fighting against these drones and it shows you how good a pilot he is and mm. uh, at the beginning of the movie and even that's just sort of it's just but he, video gaming basically and like a really he, really great rig they're not telling him you you have to do this you know because we are peaceful enforcers no these are like violent people and the, he has like training seminars where he's just beaten into the ground okay. by a, a giant gotta, monster and I gotta and, tell you something I know like mm-hmm. you know he's got like a new weapon and they want to train him and you want to treat this as sort of like a military unit Kilowog is a fan mm. favorite character from the comics. I love the character Kilowog. He's really fun. Is it Kill Owog or Kilowog. just Kill? Because they call him Kill Owog and also just Kilowog. I think they just kind of swallow that middle syllable. It's Kilowog. Uh, Kilowog. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but like Kilowog is kind of like Arlie Ermy in Full Metal Jacket, but a little cuddlier. Like but he's huge and muscly, but like you know you 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 could befriend him and have a beer after training. Like right. that's Kilowog. Um, Kilowog is kind of like a tough love kind of sergeant, but then Sinestro comes in, and apparently he was best friends with the uh, Green Lantern who died and gave Hal his ring, and he's very offended that the first human has been selected because humans are scum. Uh, (laughs) Every single thing he's doing 
uh, to train Hal Jordan. I know he's the bad guy, but even so, it doesn't seem like this is like a new. He's, he's not a bad guy yet. He's not a bad guy yet, but yeah. he's he's like on the road. You can tell he's you know because he's he, not old because he looks like the devil. He's got like big yeah. demonic. And he's played eyebrows by Mark Strong. He's played by Mark Strong. So you know he's fucked. So mm-hmm. I like Mark Strong a lot actually, but like he's just always plays the bad guy mm-hmm. and. Uh, yeah, so, like, all of this, even a lot of the stuff Kilowog does, it's actually... Like, hurting him. Well, here's the deal. The whole point is willpower, right? Mm. One of... When you look at boot camp, the, like, um, the, it's like, American... Break down your will. Yeah, the whole point, you look at the opening of Full Metal Jacket, the point is to... Full Metal Jacket actually would have been a good double feature with this. Mm. Uh, the whole point is to break down your will and make you part of a unit. Mm. But the thing is, Green Lanterns don't actually work together most of the time. They're actually individuals, and they seek out people who are... Fearless, that is the defining characteristic. So in order to instill the fear of God into them with a drill instructor is entirely counterproductive and doesn't actually make sense with the construct of the movie. It doesn't work. You know, the whole thing, especially Sinestro, was basically just to make him feel like shit about himself. That's not conducive to willpower. No. That's it's, bad. It's definitely not. Meanwhile, and you would think if it if the whole point is willpower, why do they have units at all? You think there'd be all just a bunch of free agents? They, well, they, you, need, they you need some you need some order to that. Otherwise, they'd just be out doing whatever the fuck they wanted. No, it's well, not really. If if they're righteous, then let let them to their own devices. Mm-hmm. You don't need to have these meetings where you had. All, the design is also really awful, especially all the space stuff where people are just on these darkened Honestly, rocks. It's really ugly. Really, yeah, it's, it's an it's, ugly looking. Like you want like because we, we go to this other planet and we want it to be kind of like ooh. Mm-hmm. There's even have that moment where they like take him out of like his mm-hmm. you know apartment or whatever they got him there, and it's like look up. On this planet, mm. and you got to realize, I, I think it's funny. Like it's supposed to be this moment where Hal Jordan sees another planet. And he's like, ooh, mm. and yet if you think about it, that's just like stepping out onto like Tomar Ray's balcony, like mm. downtown. Like it's really not like that special to him. It's just like mm, that, that would be like if I like showed you my balcony at my apartment. Behold be like, Earth. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, look at those power lines. Like hey, that's not really like it's only impressive because he doesn't know what he's looking at. Um, Behold the Mid Wilshire district. <laughs> so Parallax is coming to Earth, but mm. that's not important. What's important is relationship stuff and Peter Sarsgaard yeah. having the mumps. Oh uh, well, okay. And this this is another thing. So we have like a, an ancillary villain in P- the form of Peter Sarsgaard. I love Peter Sarsgaard. He's Brilliant a terrific actor, actor and I actor. think he's actually very good in this as well. He's doing what he needs because, to do. Uh, it. Ryan Reynolds looks like Ryan Reynolds. He is a damn handsome fellow. He's he's cut and he's sexy and he's charming. He is body. And they give him a counterbalance. Uh, Peter Sarsgaard is, is poking through the alien corpse and he gets infected with a little, like, chunk of yellow... Yeah. Yellow he, he doesn't find it on the street. He's a scientist yeah. and the American government... Yeah, and, and uh, Angela like, Bassett calls yeah, him in like and says... Amanda he, Waller, uh, same character yeah. Viola Davis plays in Suicide Squad. Oh, it's the same character. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, she's very important. Together. She's very important in DC right. Comics. Um, and yeah, then it turns out his dad, mm. Peter Sarsgaard's dad, is Tim Robbins, and he's a senator, and he's mm. also working with um, the test pilot organization. Yeah. So, so it's all interconnected. <laughs> it's all interconnected. Uh, but he's dissecting the alien corpse. He gets infected with this thing that allows him to start reading minds mm-hmm. and withers his body. He actually becomes weaker, and his head becomes large, and he gets all puffy. And it looks. He looks like he has the mumps. And you would think that one has like a mind power and one has a body power and there's that's sort of a good rival you don't need the <coughs> the parallax cloud in this no, dynamic at all you don't uh, or you have the mind and it's said that hal jordan doesn't think anything through he's really mm. hot-headed he's not presented as being necessarily very intelligent you mm. would think that the two would have to complement each other that's basically and work together and mm-hmm. Then Peter Sarsgaard and he have a big rivalry together, and mm-hmm. he takes uh, Blake Lively hostage. And Blake Lively plays um, mm. uh, Carol Ferris, uh, who is Green Lantern's ex-girlfriend, mm. turned girlfriend again over the course of the movie. Um, she works for slash runs mm. uh, Ferris Aircraft. Yeah, and, and she, she too is also a hotshot pilot. <clears throat> yeah, and I do like there's a moment where... After he has to use his Green Lantern powers on Earth to save Tim Robbins from mm-hmm. an accident caused by Hector Hammond, played by Peter Sarsgaard, uh, he I comes to. Remember all the names. I, I've oh, read the sorry, comics. I know yeah. the names. Okay, so he goes to Carol uh, in his Green Lantern garb with his little mask, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and he's disguising his voice all cool like the Flash on the TV show, and he's just like, "Hello, little lady, I'm the Green Lantern," and she like steps close to him. 
You're, you're how? You're how? Like, how did you recognize me? I've seen you naked. Yeah. Can, you just got this little piece of green on your face. I know who you are. <laughs> it's not complicated. It's, it's really cute. It's a I, cute I liked that. That yeah. was that was clever. Um, the Blake Lively character uh, has brought up something in my mind uh, that that addresses uh, sexism in Hollywood in in a kind of an important way. There's uh, a lot of complaints that there aren't a lot of good, strong female characters. Most, and we, and most when of we these say action, strong, we mean well characterized. Well characterized. That is not to say just physically strong can kick ass. Mm-hmm. Strong as in complex, rich, well written characters. Um, you look back at a lot of these male led superhero movies. Those female roles are are in there mm. uh, on paper. Yeah. <laughs> And this uh, here's a, a female character who is just as good a pilot as he is, yep. or, or comparable, all, comparable, comparably good pilot. She's in charge of a big corporation. Mm, she's, she's more pres- mature than he is. She's definitely more mature. She has all of the knowledge he needs. She's just written and cast really, really well, badly. I think there's more to it than that. First mm. off, I think Blake Lively can be a really good actor, but yeah. regardless. Um, and I can totally see why they cast her. I don't see any reason to think why she would have been bad at this. The issue isn't that the construct of her character is bad. The issue is, what are they going to have her do? Well, mm-hmm. here's what they're going to have her do. Uh, she's too mature to date uh, Hal Jordan, so she's going to fall in love with him again. Okay. For reasons. And uh, she's, like, you know, really cool, and she like she's a... She's a fantastic mm-hmm. fighter pilot. Uh, she can run a business, and then when the shit hits the fan, she gets kidnapped briefly and then turns on a machine. Yeah, that's yeah. a waste of a character. Like a character this, with a lot of potential. So, Carrie yeah. in the comics is a really good character, really interesting character. And, and, and here, I, I, I feel like I, I look back over the history of a lot of these movies where there's you know the hero and then quote the girl like yeah. you, the the you know, there's that book the peop- you play the girl the person a, who is described as the love interest as if that's the yeah, only like, purpose they serve and that's frustrating and, and I, I feel like we've had so much potential to bring women to the fore and have them be co leads in a lot of these movies by design like it's baked into the pudding. And the screenwriters How have... How do you make pudding? You bake it? Yeah, you bake pudding, don't you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think you bake pudding. I've made pudding before, too, and I forgot. I'm um, looking up but bake pudding. It's, it's baked into the batter. How about that? And Okay, it, it I, I has admit been, there are different kinds of pudding. Okay. okay. <laughs> there are many different kinds okay, of pudding. Okay, I was thinking... Baked into like, the rice pudding. Fine. Okay, no, just think, you know, like, you you know, like bread rice. pudding. And that's, that you bake that, probably. I don't know. <laughs> My point being... I was just thinking like chocolate pudding like in a cup. That that it's only been a deficient, like a constant decades long deficiency in creative screenwriting Mm -hmm. that is is keeping these women off to the side. And it's not unique to superhero movies. Oh, definitely not. A lot of action movies Mm -hmm. tend to be these sort of very male-centric fantasies Mm -hmm. and they very much sideline female characters. This goes back to every James Bond uh, movie, a lot of Hitchcock movies. Not all, but a lot. Men tend to be the screenwriters. They Uh tend to assume that the men are the primary audience. Uh So they're going to present the females as prizes for a male audience which to is, fulfill that male fantasy. Which is lame. Um, it's lame because they're not thinking of women because it, let, let, women write those movies, geez. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I feel like when I saw Blake Lively, it's like, this is a great character. Mm-hmm. And it made me realize how we've had these great characters ruined by a lack of creativity. Because that's the thing. Green Lantern is an incredibly creative concept. Like, say what you will about how bizarre it is or how hard it is to wrap your head around. They were creative. Mm. They didn't just do a usual thing. They did something weird. I suppose it's unique. It is distinctive. Mm. And yet they sell it as if it's just anything. Like, it's Mm. just every scene just plays in the most simple... Like, the one scene that was kind of fun is just her recognizing him immediately. Mm. Everything else, there's no fun to it. There's no creativity to it. Everything is there. Like, Taika Waititi, who would go on to direct Thor Ragnarok, (laughs) is afraid. Uh, He's in it as, Mm. like, a Green Lantern's, like, psychic character. But he's just there for him to have someone to talk to. Mm. It's got nothing. Like he, he, he contributes literally le- nothing to the, the plot. The death of Abin Sur, the the Green Lantern who dies and gives his ring to Hal Jordan, is treated like this big tragedy. But you got to realize we don't know that Abin Sur. Mm. Even if you know him from the comics, you don't know that one. Yeah, 
We don't know that guy. You're taking everything for granted, Mm -hmm. and you're not selling it. You're taking for granted that we accept Green Lantern rings. Mm -hmm. We don't. You need to sell that. And what their solution was to dump more exposition on it, when in actuality what they needed to do was take it all away. I think think the solution to this movie— No backstory. You start with Hal Jordan. Yes. He's he's having whatever his drama is, and then an alien crashes in front of him randomly. We don't know who, what it is. Mm -hmm. It's this mysterious thing. That is— that is that is how the comic began. Okay, then they did it right in the comic, and yeah. and he like he finds the ring, and the, the alien says some cryptic things to him about the power mm-hmm. of the ring and the space cops, and he has this ring, and he doesn't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Then, like, I, I guess this is when like a trainer. This is when Sinestro, Kilowog. Sinestro. Sin- okay, Sinestro this, shows that's, up. That's what happens in the comics. Okay, Sinestro. <laughs> fine, then do the comics. Sinestro yeah. shows up and like starts giving him like all on Earth. Yeah, we don't need to yeah. th- whisk him off and that, have him this, you know cadre of monsters that, that, that's also what happens in the comics or at least what happens in like this the, mm. it, originally it took more time but like in mm. the rebooted like timeline that they fixed like yeah, yeah that's what happened and then like, it, that's the thing it's me, just meanwhile it's just he says training all, day and, with space cops and then he also says and here's your crisis a little piece of like yellow ring fell on the planet and mm-hmm. it's it's infected somebody this you guy, know Hector this Hammer. guy you yeah. know and and we have to you're trained because he's getting more powerful every day and we see that in cutaways that would be enough and then you, this is the canon film version of that you can make this for like 15 million dollars in 1987 and, then and it, it would have been great and then it ends mm-hmm. the movie ends with Hal Jordan going off into space to join the Dream Lander Corp proper mm-hmm. and by that point we accept the premise it's all based on like earth like human character stuff I get that you want to get to the cool weird stuff but you were going to airball it anyway because I saw Green Lantern <laughs> and then you have the freedom mm. to get weird in Green and Green Lantern, Lantern too, yeah. Green Lantern gets weird <laughs> When Al, like read Alan Moore's Green Lantern stories, oh, they're God. insane. They're brilliant, but they're insane. There's a whole planet that's a Green Lantern. There's but, a whole planet, but like a living planet. That yeah, is... Mogo, like, the the planet that is a Green Lantern. Oh that's a God. thing. It it's a, really neat. Guess it needs a big ring. Yeah, there's a there's a uh, there's a Green Lantern on a planet mm. where uh, there's no light. So it doesn't understand the concept of green. So they had to change it. They had to change it to the, he's not the Green Lantern. He's the F sharp bell. It's a lot of weird stuff. It's a lot of weird stuff. Uh, It's really fun. Like one of my early exposures to Green Lantern was a trading card of a Mm -hmm. Green Lantern character that was essentially a giant crystal egg with a mohawk and tentacles. Mm -hmm. Like there's some weird stuff going on in there. I will say that because here's the thing. Green Lantern, the comics, they're weird, but they have they figured it out. They figured Mm -hmm. out the tone. They figured out how to bring you into it. The characters are stronger than they are in this movie. There's good stuff here. The movie doesn't even seem to understand the basic premise. And this is the thing that frustrates me because the whole point of the Green Lantern is that, you know, the ring picks out, picks out the most qualified person, but the whole idea of the ring is if you have sufficient willpower, if you're able to conquer your fear, mm. you can become a Green Lantern. That's the thing that they tell you mm. over and over again in the movie. And then later on, Hector Hammond insists that the Green Lantern, like, I'll give you Blake Lively if you give me your Green Lantern ring. And he gives him the Green Lantern ring. And then he can't use it. Or he thinks he can, but he's actually just... Or he uses he, it for a second and then it flies off his well, head. Well, Hal Jordan's yeah. using it from afar. But, like, mm. he's like, no, you don't understand. You have to be chosen. No, you don't. <laughs> you are chosen because you're the most qualified candidate. Mm. But No. You just need to be fearless. That's actually bullshit. And what you've done is you have taken, like, the message of the hero, which is that anyone can be a hero if they conquer their fear, and you made it into literally no one can be a hero unless you're chosen by a space Mm. ring. That's fucking (laughs) stupid. That is fucking Mm. stupid, and that is not the Green Lantern. You can't do that. That would be like, um, like, if imagine if they they rebooted Batman. And at some point, there was someone was just like, well, you know, I, I could, Robin goes up to Batman. And he's like, I would like to train to be a Batman as well. And Bruce Wayne is like, no, you, you, you can't unless uh, unless you were bitten by a bat. Unless the, unless, what? The, unless the bat chose you. Yeah, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> that has nothing to do with You just made it more yeah. obtuse. Now, it, it's pretty bad. It's not a good it's, movie. It's not a good movie. Uh, it, it it's not like it doesn't go down sour. It's just clunky and strange and, and badly put together. Yeah, it's not like a catastrophe. Mm-hmm. Like you could watch it. Yeah, but like yeah, it's just it, there's a reason it didn't spawn a sequel. There's a reason it didn't jumpstart the franchise and they had to start all over again mm-hmm. because it got no one excited about mm-hmm. anything. 
We did see a Green Lantern in uh, Justice League, and the, there was Briefly. a flashback scene where we saw a Green Briefly. Lantern at that work was cool. in Justice League. It was, it was, was a cool. yeah, cute little cameo. Yeah. Um, there's a, there are so many concepts at play, like half-baked ideas in Green Lantern, that mm-hmm. it was really difficult to come up with a B feature. And I let you take point on this one, mm-hmm. and you picked a weird one. But before we get into that, mm-hmm. a lot of, uh, we, we as we do, uh, mm-hmm. we put it out on Schmoville after we had selected our B feature. Mm-hmm. Um, and we let you guess. We let you guess. And no one got it. Some people were kind of close. Mm-hmm. Some people were on the right wavelength, but like they didn't quite nail it. Um, so we're going to read off a few of our of our favorites. The first person, Jonathan Spiroff, uh, suggested Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah. That mm, makes sense. All right. You know, why is cop, cracking cop, cop not taking out, it seriously? Out of, fish out of that, water sort of in yeah. a new city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Last Starfighter, uh, which is one of my mm-hmm. suggestions. You didn't take it. Uh, it's a great story about a kid being selected to join a space armada. It's yeah, a little yeah. on the nose, but it works <laughs> real, real great. A little, little too on the nose for my taste. But, um, yeah. Let's see what we got here. Flash Gordon, another great mm-hmm. idea there. Top Gun. We're not big fans of Top Gun. Yeah, well, Top Gun is actually top- a, a really excellent pairing, but we don't like Top Gun. <laughs> I, I like it more than you. I think there are things it does real, real well. But like, mm. yeah, I, I don't consider that a great movie mm. in a conventional yeah, sense. The, the most obvious one was Training Day, but mm-hmm. uh, there's actually that's more inherent to the premise than it is actually in Green Lantern. Yeah. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, Ryan Martinson suggested Enemy Mine, which is actually a great movie. Well, that that's just, that's just a great about. movie. But yeah. uh, let's see what we I, got. I'm not exactly sure how it pairs with Green Lantern, but it's just a uh, good science fiction film. Michael Wilson suggested Nightmare on Elm Street because it, too, is about uh, facing a fear demon. Mm-hmm. I see where you're going with that. I, I would have used Part 3 because that has like the superpower aspect as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see what we got here. The, uh, Calvin Johnson recommended The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. That's a good pick. I like that one. <laughs> a lot. That's real, real fun. They're both very strange. Uh, Paulo Yama had an interesting suggestion. Uh, Kurosawa's Kagamusha. Mm. He says there is an interesting parallel to draw between the warlord slash peasant as there is with Abin Sur and Hal Jordan uh, in terms of someone taking over the identity of a, of a predecessor mm. and bringing something new to it. And both films lean heavily into the creative and dreamlike visuals. That's a really good point. Uh, <laughs> Paul Kinosian suggested my dinner with Andre. I, th- I think you're just joking at that point. That's still you're just fun. you're just joshing us. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, the Karate Kid might make sense here too, says John Mariano. That makes sense. He also said, "Please be just one of the guys," which I don't get. Just, have you seen the movie Just One of the I Guys? I've seen Just One of the yeah, Guys. I, I don't understand it either. I, it's like the Twelfth Night. I don't really. I, th- I think the th- I thing. think they also might just be Josh and us there. All right, that's fine. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else here. Earth Girls Are Easy was a fun choice. You know, I watched that recently for the first like for the first time all the way through. I think mm-hmm. like I'd seen most of it like in bits and pieces. Yeah, that th- that is a like a, a lax movie. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's not that good. And I love Julie Brown. Julie Brown like that, that that's her brainchild, and yeah. she's wonderful. Uh, David Cohen suggested Full Metal Jacket. Again, okay. I still think that would have been a good idea. David Crossan suggested The Right Stuff, which I also mm-hmm. think would have been a really good idea. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything. There's a ton here. Yeah, I, I don't have time to talk about everyone's choices. Oh, and uh, Brian Nyland suggested Ernest Goes to Camp. Quote: They are the same movie. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, green, green, yeah. green-powered space cop, Ernest P. Worrell. They're 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 the same. Yeah. There once was an end named Worrell, Ernest P. Worrell. That's from Ernest Rides Again. It sure that's, is. That's the fifth movie in the Ernest <laughs> series. I've um, seen all eleven of those suckers. The movie that we ended up picking, or the movie that Whitney ended up picking, and I said fine. <laughs> uh, because I love this movie, I find I, I'm curious. I, I'm curious about his argument. Uh, we ended up picking Brian De Palma's really incredible mm. blockbuster gangster thriller The Untouchables. Uh, it was a big, big hit in 1987 mm-hmm. when it came out. Um, Nominated for a bunch of Oscars. A bunch of one, Oscars. One for Sean Connery, Best Supporting Actor. Um, I think it's a legit great movie. Like, capital G, great movie. Um, I agree. Uh, really, like, tight, wonderful screenplay. Great, splashy photography. Brian De Palma is, you know, he's not subtle he's a really energetic director and Mm -hmm. i wanted to choose a movie that was like legit great the right stuff is also a great film Mm -hmm. but i i wanted to sort of underline the notion that the green lantern is a cop that he's part of this like secret police force and i was trying to find some sort of real world 
parallel of a secret police force. The Untouchables is based on a true story. Mm-hmm. And uh, the elite police force that was out in Chicago tracking down super criminals was Elliot Ness and his Untouchables. Okay, fair enough. I thought that this was the the best real world parallel to something like Greenland. Here, here, here was my thing and here's why I was feeling a bit detached from this. First, again, I loved the Untouchables and I'm excited we get to talk about mm-hmm. it, but I was just like, I didn't see a clear parallel between Hal Jordan mm-hmm. and Elliot Ness. And then I realized Hal Jordan is Andy Garcia. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, okay, now I understand. He's it. a little bit more of the, hot, okay. the hothead character. So if you don't know this movie, and again, it was a huge hit when it came out, but it didn't like spawn a franchise again, so mm. like you might have missed it if you're well, younger. It's, it's not a franchise type movie. Well, it's my point is, is that the, it, it, it didn't linger. Story, yeah. There was a couple other attempts to make an Untouchable TV series. Anyway, mm. The Untouchables was uh, first off, it was an adaptation, particularly of a television series uh, starring Robert Stack mm. uh, from the Airplane movies. <laughs> uh, back when he back when he like many of the actors in the airplane movies was known for doing serious stuff mm. um the untouchables was actually the name given to elliot ness uh who is a uh, federal agent who was brought into chicago in the time of prohibition back when alcohol was illegal but it was an incredibly lucrative black market trade uh in order to basically bring al capone to justice al capone is one of america's the, most notorious gangsters he, in history he, yeah he he was he ran every kind of racket there was he was a notorious bootlegger and he was really charismatic was and larger than life it was one of those like that he was like a, a crime lord was one of those open secrets everybody knew he was a crime lord but you don't say it to him to his face in public yeah but yeah he just goes out in the streets he kind of does whatever he wants and he gets away with it and there was no real way to stop him because his empire was so powerful and the police were kind of had their hands tied he also had a lot of police in his pocket mm-hmm. so paid off all the politicians all the politicians like, he he kind of ruled Chicago while yeah. he was acting and there's so many stories about Al Capone yeah. and they're probably all and true. they're probably every well, single one of one them. One of the more famous ones makes it into the Untouchables. Uh, it's after Al Capone is, uh, you know, kind of on, you know, Elliot Ness is kind of a thorn in his side now, and he's pissed. Mm-hmm. And he brings all of his lieutenants in for a big dinner. And Robert De Niro has, Robert De Niro plays Al Capone in the movie. He's fantastic. <laughs> well, the, the whole cast is The whole cast is amazing. Yeah. But Robert De Niro, like, mm-hmm. owns it as Al Capone. And he gives a big speech about enthusiasms. Everyone mm. has enthusiasms. One of my enthusiasms, and he holds up a big baseball bat. Yeah, it's, baseball! It's baseball! And he talks about how there's a team where everyone's out for themselves, but in the end, we only win if the team wins. Let me show you how this works. And he just hits one of his guys on the head over and over again until he's dead, and the blood is soaking into the perfect white uh, 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 tablecloth. Mm. And he's just like, okay. Clean that up? Yeah. All right, Everyone's yeah. just like, okie dokie. We're still afraid of you. <laughs> yeah, nothing has changed. I'm going to finish my ribeye. Like, that's all we got right now. Um, D- uh, D- D- so, De so, De Niro is such a great actor. But um, So, uh, Elliot Ness mm-hmm. assembled a team Elliot of N- cops that he thought he could trust. Well, El- and Elliot they- Ness is... Pursued Al Capone, and that's the story. Elliot Ness, who's played by uh, Kevin Costner, mm-hmm. is... At the height of Kevin Costner. The, like, su- this was yeah. like his big movie star well, role. I would say Robin Hood is his big movie star. I meant first. Role, but, uh, yeah, I suppose. Like so. this is probably his first big kind big, of the, the big one, one that cracked him he, out. He'd been um, on the periphery with stuff like Fandango for, mm-hmm. and, but like this was like, oh yeah, Kevin Costner, mm-hmm. he's the shit. Uh, he was Elliot Ness was specifically tasked with bringing down Al Capone. Like he was, he's on the Al Capone case, not investigating, just going in and abusing his power however he could. Now. The film embellishes his story by adding uh, Sean Connery, mm-hmm. who I believe is completely fictional. A lot of this movie is completely fictional. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the characters who are real mm. are presented in a very fictional way. Mm. Uh, of character, uh, real life gangster Frank Needy mm. uh, is played by Billy Drago. In this movie, and he's like Al Capone's like top assassin. In reality, that wasn't what Frank Needy was like at all. But like yeah, they're yeah. taking enormous liberties. But uh, his character Malone, I believe, is his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of gives Elliot Ness the uh, the wherewithal to just be as forthright as possible and play by Al Capone's rules. And he has this really great little speech. Like, here's how you deal with Al Capone. He sent like he sends he, one of your guys he, to he the pulls, hospital. He pulls, he pulls out a knife. You pull out a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital. You send one of his to the morgue. Have to play like 
play hard and play dirty with this guy. And Elliot Ness wants to be moral. He only wants to work within the law. And over the course of the film, he finds himself pushed which, further into the edge because Chicago a, doesn't work in an idealized system. And it's a brilliant way of approaching the character of Elliot Ness by giving, letting him be a hugely moral character, but also uh, being able to compromise that with the fact that he did some pretty violent things. You know, and rather than have him be a single conflicted character who does violent things, you give all of his violent impulses to Malone mm -hmm. and you can have like the two halves of the same character converse. And I think that's so great. It's, it's really dynamic just to watch them interact, but it's mm -hmm. also a really smart way of presenting Elliot Ness and keeping him kind of the square hero that history remembers him as. The, un the Untouchables, the movie, is a really interesting movie because it is incredibly intelligent. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it was, a it smart was, movie. It was written by David Mamet. Yeah, who's <laughs> one, one of the best dialogue scribes mm -hmm. in history. And it's full of great writing, full of great scenes, full of great I, moments. However, uh -huh. it's also incredibly broad. It's told well, in it's, big, it's broad de, strokes. It's diploma for well, you. But, but yeah. regardless, it's it's told like it's full of these amazing set pieces. This like horseback raid on a bridge, mm -hmm. and this incredible. We're going to talk about it. There's this incredible sequence on the staircase, which is mm -hmm. cinematic perfection. <laughs> like there's, we, I learned the, seriously. We we learned this scene in film school. Yeah, like they, the, they, the they we practically it. spent a day mm -hmm. on it. Just it's such an incredible piece of work. Um, but um. It is so broad. You look at Elliot Ness and his portrayal. Kevin Costner is great in this because he gets to be real wide-eyed and he gets darker as the film mm -hmm. goes on. Like at the beginning, he's like, they're about to do a big raid and like, you know, get some get some of that booze. And he just yells at all the cops, let's do some good. <laughs> like he's a Dick Tracy character. He's so mm -hmm. big. This is a comic book. Like the way that Brian De Palma films this movie in particular, because like Brian De Palma is full of virtuoso camera shots, but often he's going for a very deeply disturbed psychological bent. Mm -hmm. Here, everything is just perfect perfectly framed mm. all the time. Ennio Morricone's score <laughs> is one of the great superhero scores ever, and it's for a cop movie. Mm. It's really great. Like, it's, it's so propulsive. Like, the opening credits is just the words, the untouchables, mm -hmm. and then the credits over it, and Ennio Morricone's score is so fucking great. We, it holds your attention. We've talked about sort of the artificiality of film that was really kind of in vogue in, in the 80s and 90s that uh, we, we don't really have that sort of Mm. something so boldly cinematic anymore. And I think by th this was the trend at the time was to sort of take these historical heroes and turn them into something a little more pulpy. I and, see that. And, though. Like, and, I think and in fact, Snyder was, was trying that, but he was I guess let down so, by his material. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and, but this is actually exactly where Tim Burton's Batman came from. You know, this preceded Batman mm. and Batman was in the same tradition. And then Warren Beatty made Dick Tracy, which was the exact same thing all it's over basically again. basically a marriage of Batman and the untouchables. Uh, more, uh, cinematically, more or less, cinematically speaking. It predates. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the, Brian De Palma was a, a cinematic craftsperson. He wasn't trying to tell a biography. He was trying to tell the legend. And mm -hmm. of, so, of course, in order to do that, he had to play it really broad. He had to make the characters a lot bigger. He had to make the camera a lot bigger. He had to use a lot more slow motion and dynamic action shots. You talked about the raid on the bridge. The movie just stops and just becomes a western yeah. in that sequence. Yeah, and you look at like, it, it becomes a pulp novel. I mean, it's, it's like reading several different volumes of a pulp novel. Mm -hmm. Well, like you look at like a lot of comic books, and what they try to do is they try to create, they try to evoke imagery that we already know. Uh, there's a uh, you look at like for example Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. A lot of people have read that. Um, there's like a big bit at the end where there's a big riot in Gotham City and everything, and Batman and his and his posse right in on horseback, mm. and that evokes <laughs> that evokes the western, that evokes knights on horseback. They're, they're, he's Frank was playing very clearly off of familiar iconography, and he's Brian De Palma is turning Elliot Ness and the Untouchables, and their and they're, the fact that they are untouchable by corruption, even their attempts at corruption are inherently noble mm. as Brian De Palma sees it. And you can argue all you want, how irresponsible that is. Um, he uses this cavalry charge and Ennio Morricone's sweepingly heroic <laughs> music as they like, they're, and like the Mounties uh, from Canada, they're basically mm. like cornering these gangsters on a bridge. Mm. And it's a great sequence. We need to talk about the two other members of The Untouchables. First off, Sean Connery is great. Kevin Costner is great. Andy Garcia, young Andy Garcia, is in this movie uh, as the uh, rookie 
uh, who is also a, a crack shot. Yeah, but his, and, his superpower is that he never misses. Yeah, and he's really, really good. And this is a relatively smaller role, but he's really good for me. The third lead in the movie is Charles Martin Charles Smith. Charles Martin Smith. <laughs> well, I guess I guess it's De Niro. It's Costner, well, the, Connery, of, of De Niro, the, and then Charles Martin Of the Martin Untouchables. Smith. Yeah. But yeah, Charles Martin Smith is a, a, a federal accountant. Mm-hmm. He has a badge. He works for the police department, but he doesn't do any beat cop stuff. He's just an office guy. Yeah. he's he's His whole thing is he's the one who says we need to get Al Capone on income tax mm-hmm. evasion because that's what we can get him on. We and, got this. And that's... That's what we got him on. That's and, how that's how they nailed yeah. Al Capone. They got him on taxes. That's how they were able to bring him in. It's really interesting to watch the Untouchables and see how they try to make getting someone on income tax the most exciting thing in the world, and they figure it out. <laughs> well, and I love that Charles Martin Smith says immediately, "Is like, well, we can get him on our income taxes. All I need is like a couple books, and I can prove it, and we can just arrest him mm-hmm. because he hasn't paid any income taxes." And Elliot Ness says, "Well, that's kind of boring. Let's do something more exciting for yeah. like uh, half of the movie like first. He, he rolls his eyes." Yeah. But like there's a bit where um you know they're gonna go on a big raid mm-hmm. and Sean Connery's like, Well, we need another guy to like watch the door or whatever. And he goes to Charles Martin Smith and says, Hey, you have a badge? He's like, Yeah. Okay, here's now, your gun. Now you're you have a gun. Us. And Charles Martin Smith, like, there's a second where he's afraid, and then he just smells like <laughs> I get to be a hero. And he goes no. off. And there's a scene on the bridge where like like, you know, it's basically him alone versus like a half dozen gangsters uh-huh. and he ends up being the biggest badass <laughs> ever and here's the thing you might not know the name Charles Martin Smith you'd recognize him he he's an act, he's a very good actor uh, yeah. he was in John Carpenter's Starman mm-hmm. uh, he was in uh, Never Cry Wolf that's sort of like his big starring role because mm-hmm. it's mostly him in that movie most people don't know that movie anymore uh, but it's he, good and he uh, ended up directing Air Bud yeah. he was in, he was in uh, uh, American Graffiti mm. he was in more American Graffiti um, yeah he's had this really long career as a character actor and a very successful director and this was a really really great role for him because he looks kind of nerdy but then you give him a moment to shine and he nails it yeah and he's really great the big centerpiece of the movie is this sequence one of the main characters in the movie has died tragically in a really incredible sequence like a really incredible moving sequence but as they're dying they give elliot ness this like piece of paper and it just says, no, the, the accountant that you need to get Al Capone is going to be on this train mm. in a couple of minutes. So <laughs> you don't even have time to mourn. And so they go to the train station. They're waiting for the guy to show up mm. and they're just waiting here in this big staircase and they're waiting for him to show up. They know it's going to be bad. It's probably going to be bloody. The guy's got bodyguards. And then a lady starts coming in very slowly. With a baby carriage. With a baby carriage and a baby in it. Yeah. Like very slowly working her way up the steps. And they're just like, get out of here. Get out of here, lady. We can't make a big deal out of this. They'll know something's and up. And Elliot Ness, <laughs> Boy Scout that he is. <laughs> Understanding that you know they, they need to you know crack down on criminals who are about to pass through, decides to help her take it out. Not, let's not, let's not expedite just to, this. Ex, not just to not just to you know get her out of the way, but because he's a decent guy and she clearly needs help. Yeah, it, yeah, she's struggling. Like it yeah. sucks. And then what happens is the guy shows up right when the baby's near the top of the staircase. Not all the way in the top yet. So the guy, one of the guys recognizes Elliot Ness and a huge shootout begins. Mm. And the baby carriage starts rolling down this huge <laughs> staircase with the baby in it. And then this is brilliant. Mm. And it's and it's all based on the mo- silent movie Battleship Potemkin, which yeah, is one of the most important movies ever made. It helped uh, well, define the way we edit every movie. We'll, we'll get to Battleship Potemkin at some point. There's only but, a matter uh, of time. But th- there's a sequence in that movie it's from 1916, I think, where um, it takes place on the uh, the Odessa steps. And, um, 1925. Oh, 25. Way I was way off. You're right. Um, yeah, where uh, there's just a big slaughter on this, these, this gigantic staircase. And it's uh, this extended sequence. It's brilliantly edited. And one of the icons from that sequence is a, a baby carriage rolling down the stairs away from its presumably dead parents. Yeah. And in The Untouchables, what happens is there's the baby carriages rolling down the staircase you know, completely, you know, mm. like a tragedy is about to occur in slow motion. Mm. And as the baby carriage is going down and in slow motion, it takes a couple of minutes. <laughs> There's a huge shootout going on. And what they're doing is they're basically saying this shootout, this crazy, insane shootout with all these different moving parts happened in the time it took for that baby carriage to roll down. Mm. And you're just waiting for the tragedy to happen. And it's well, one of it- the great bits of suspense 
ever. Here, here's the weird thing. It's suspenseful and part of the shootout. And, and again, L.A. is such a decent guy that he has to catch the, the carriage before it reaches the bottom of the staircase. Mm-hmm. Now, there's not like a pit of spikes at the bottom of the staircase or anything. Mm-hmm. The, the, presumably, the baby carriage would just roll to the bottom of the stairs and just roll to Look, a stop. But here's the thing. That baby but carriage. But you get it's so well filmed that you think something horrible is Look, going to happen when that, the baby carriage reaches the bottom of the staircase. If that baby carriage tilts over, mm-hmm. that, ba- that baby's just going to fall down the steps. Yeah. Anyone falling down the steps. Mm-hmm. Those steps would hurt themselves real, real bad. Mm. That th- there's a real danger there. I, think. I, I understand, but I think it's it's such good filmmaking that you forget that the baby actually isn't in any sort of real peril. <laughs> um. Mm. So yeah. So here's the thing. I feel like in some respects, comparing Green Lantern to The Untouchables really mm. is sort of an optimistic view of Green Lantern (laughs) because it implies that Green Lantern Mm. could, was potentially about really being a space cop Mm. and it's not. It should have been. That's the point. Well, I mean, but like, it's, it's, it's it only, never gets like, there. Like I said, there, it's only one of many concepts that are n- never followed through with in Green Lantern. There's no. not one th- like through line in Green Lantern that I could really attach myself to. So I had to think of like, what is the sim- like the most fundamental premise mm-hmm. of Green? You take away all of the weird mythology. What what story are they telling? And it's about a, a cop, mm-hmm. and it's about a, a, a law enforcement agent who is recruited into the secret cadre of, of crime fighters. And for me, what I see actually, I think is really more of like, almost like the cautionary tale of it, mm-hmm. um, is the untouchables isn't, it's, it's based on a true story, but like, it's still, if you didn't know it was based on a true story, you'd never believe it. It's such a weird sequence mm-hmm. of events. And yeah, they changed a lot of things for the movie, but you know, it's, it's such a broad, brassy and dynamic gangster story that it feels implausible. Mm. Brian De Palma uh, managed to tell this incredibly raw, raw story of grand cops and robbers heroism. And it's a little hokey Mm. and it's a little hardcore (laughs) and it's really smart and it's really broad. Mm. He managed to tell this really broad story in a way that's really entertaining, but he managed to make it grounded. He managed to make it human mm. you have a great center of this movie with elliot ness and his wife played by a young patricia clarkson who's a really brilliant actor she doesn't get as much to do in this movie but she's really good in it and you have this really great mentor relationship with him and sean connery mm. uh, who was a beat cop who never really had a chance to do, do anything with his career and now is getting a chance like this late mm. but he's really wise he's seen everything um Green Lantern doesn't have those things. The relationship he has with Blake Lively is really superficial and really kind of only there for the plot. And he has no mentor. Kilowog doesn't actually have anything meaningful to say to him. Mm. Sinestro rejects him. There's this weird moment where Tim Robbins has a line where with him and Peter Sarsgaard, it was just like, yeah, it's like, you're my son too. I'm like, you, do, you don't, we don't even know that you know him. Did they grow up together? <laughs> what are you oh, talking about? When, like all of the emotional connections connection mm. is just whiffed it, it uh, watching the untouchables immediately after watching green lantern just yeah really underlines all of those things you were talking about just sort of all of its weaknesses and how how it should be done right um you said that De Palma keeps it grounded. I think he actually had the opposite intention. I think he was trying to tell a good story you know, that is emotionally satisfying with characters you can actually get behind and feel things for. And when characters die, and they do die, uh, you do actually feel something. But Grounded De, might De, not have been the De, right De Palma, word. yeah, he, he, he faced away from realism. He was not uh, the type of filmmaker who was really trying to to tell stories that took place in reality. He liked to set them in these kind of heightened universes, especially as he went on. Things got like increasingly implausible until you get to stuff like Snake Eyes and Femme Fatale, which are just... <sighs> It's like fascinating, but crap. Fa- I love Femme Fatale. Snake Eyes is not good. I like uh, the opening of Snake Eyes. It's fucking phenomenal. The the the, the, the split screen sequence, yeah, of, of Snake Eyes is really great, and he likes to do the the split screen stuff. But I, I like that you know when when I you look at Green Lantern, which is this sort of comic booky universe, and the approach to making comic book movies in this decade has been to try to set them in the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, 
this doesn't pull like a Batman Begins or anything. It's not anything plausible about the Green Lantern, but it is trying to envision this really strange, broad character in the real world. And Brian De Palma said, well, we need to alter the world to make sure these characters feel like they're actually like, the, like they could actually exist. Mm-hmm. And in ma- taking like a realistic story and making it more broad and more comic booky, that's actually a smarter approach than trying to take a fantastical character and make it realistic. So they kind of serve as counterpoints vaguely tonally in that regard. Mm. Uh, that, and that's The Untouchables. Fair enough. Mm. And it's great. And if you haven't seen it, you should. And if you haven't seen it recently, see it again. It holds up. <laughs> it's really great. It's, it's, it's better than Green Lantern. still gangbusters. There's a lot that's better than Green Lantern. That's true. Uh, so uh, that's it for mm. the main show, Critically Acclaimed. Uh, the next week, we're going to be reviewing an entire movie franchise. We're going to be reviewing all the Rambo films. That'll be fun. Um, and then the month after that, we're going to be reviewing uh, uh, another poll. The last week of every month, uh, we're going to be reviewing another poll. The last week of every <laughs> month, we review an entire movie franchise. Mm-hmm. Uh, this time, it was all kind of movies with a ro- movie franchises with a romantic slant. Mm-hmm. And uh, I owe you an apology because we're originally going to do uh, The Cutting Edge, which has like four movies, The Prince and Me, which has like five movies. And and isn't one of them like the Prince and Me colon the Elephant Adventure? That's the most recent one. I was excited. <laughs> I was excited to find okay. out what the hell that meant. I yeah. was super excited to review the Prince and Me. I really hope there's like a talking elephant. And then the third one. option was supposed to be Honey, mm-hmm. the dance movies that originally starred uh, Jessica Alba. And then I screwed up and accidentally put Legally Blonde instead. And then everyone voted for Legally Blonde. Like, so we'll do Legally Blonde. We offered we'll, it to you. We'll do it. That's my bad. But you you get like a whole poll like next yeah. month. That's like nothing but your picks because of that. Because oh, I totally fucked that up. Oh, goody. Yeah, I totally fucked that up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Lily Bomb was he was supposed to be on there. <laughs> but everyone, like, it, it, you can vote if you want, but it was a runaway. Like, everyone wanted Legally Blonde. I've discovered, le- like, Legally Blonde has, like, a fans. Cult. Oh, it's a cult. Yeah. I mean, it's a hit Broadway musical, too. Like, it it like, is now, a, but yeah. I didn't think people, like, had affection for Like, it they enjoyed po- it. It was yeah. a popular movie. It was, like, a really popular movie when it came There are a lot of popular movies that people don't carry affection yeah, for. They kind of, sweet. they enjoy it, and then they put it down. I remember being a sweet film, so we will discuss yeah, that. Right. There was Legally Blonde. There was Legally Blonde 2, Red, White, and Blonde. There was the straight-to-video sequel, Legally Blondes. Directed by Savage Steve Holland. No shit. Yep. Didn't know that. <laughs> uh, and then there was the TV movie version of the musical. They like mm-hmm. aired it as like a big TV event, so we'll review that as well. There's also a TV pilot. So this will be but another... that's not a feature film. But, but, yeah. that, but we will do another crossover with Cancel Too Soon. <laughs> so that's going to be real, real exciting. Um, we have time. Let's, we need to do a couple of letters. A couple it's, of letters. It is 2.30 yeah. in the morning. Okay. So we're... Because we, we can only record at weird times. Yeah. Uh, here is a letter from uh, Yash, Y-A-S-H. I think mm-hmm. that's how you pronounce it. Uh, hey, Whitney and Bibbs, love the podcast. Tune in every week. I wanted to know your thoughts on the filmography of Andre Tarkovsky. Oh. I've only recently finished it myself. Finally managed to hunt down and find a copy of Nostalgia. Wow. Also, what bad film would you pair with any one of his if you were to do a podcast on Tarkovsky? Keep up the great work. You're my favorite critics. Oh, well, thank um, you, Josh. Okay, so here's the deal. Mm-hmm. I am not super duper familiar with the work of Andre Tarkovsky. Well, you've seen some, right? Not really. Like I, I've seen right. Nostalgia. Like that's about it. Okay. Like I've never seen Solaris. I know I need to see Solaris. <gasps> I've Solaris. never seen Stalker. I know I need to see Stalker. I have seen the remake of Solaris and I've read Solaris, the book. Oh, okay. Um, I've read St- St- Steven Soderbergh's version is very respectable, but like I hear mm-hmm. the Tarkovsky's version is amazing. Um, Solaris is a sci-fi story about um, people off in space, and they make contact with an alien intelligence that takes the form of people they've met before. And it's very deeply yeah, it, psychological, it, and yeah, like the the geography of their ship changes depending on what they're thinking, mm-hmm. and it's all based on the uh, the things from their own subconscious. And that that's a premise that has been played with so much that there's actually a lot of double future possibilities yeah. with that. You could do like Barry um, Levinson's Sphere or uh, uh, Galaxy of Terror or something like that. Tarkovsky uh, Event like, Horizon. <laughs> Tarkovsky uh, hated editing. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, f- like Stalker for instance is like a like a 155 minute film. I forgot. It's, it's a very long film mm-hmm. and I think it only has like 19 shots. It's like really really sparely mm-hmm. edited and he didn't like to cut and he liked to have really really long takes where nothing happens at all and um 
it, it becomes like not even a meditation. It becomes this kind of somnambulistic uh, vision of what cinema ought to be. And a lot of people don't have the patience for Andrei Tarkovsky. I don't have the patience for Stalker. Mm-hmm. I, I think Stalker is just really, really difficult to push through. You really have to be in a state to, to get through Stalker. And I like long, slow-moving movies. That's not it, It's not a pacing thing for me. It's just his particular brand of cinematic hypnosis is something you... I just can't... I'm not always on the wavelength for. I love uh, Solaris, however. I think that's a really terrific movie. And um, Mm. that's kind of where my experience with Tarkovsky begins and ends. Um, I I still need to see, like, Andrei Rublev and and some of his other films to to really kind of jibe with what he does. So um, I look forward to exploring more, but I'll have more to say later in my life. Okay. Uh, Let's talk... uh, Let's let's, uh, let's do another one. Mm. Okay. Um, here's one uh, from uh, Will, Will Weiss. Mm-hmm. Uh, hello, friends. Recently, my wife and I were talking about the Sister Act movies. <laughs> she was talking about how fond she was of the first one, which at that point I hadn't seen, and I was telling her how good I remembered the sequel. So on a whim, mm-hmm. we had a Sister Act marathon. I was blown away by the first movie at how funny and heartfelt it was. The scene where Whoopi is teaching the nuns to sing and listen together might be one of the best, quote, teaching sessions I've ever seen put on screen. Okay. Great script, great acting, realistic stakes, just a crackerjack surprise of a movie. Then we watched the sequel, which I hadn't seen since since high school about 10 years ago. Woof, what a terrible cash grab of a movie. I couldn't believe that I had ever thought it was good or that I looked <laughs> forward to my choir teacher doing it, showing it to us. Mm-hmm. My wife was classy enough to not make fun of me much after our viewing, but I don't know if I can ever watch Sister Act 2 again without cringing. Are there any movies this has happened to you with? Watching mm-hmm. a movie that you once loved and just been utterly shocked at how bad it truly is mm-hmm. years later. Thanks for reading. Yeah. Um, Soap Dish. Really? Uh, Soap Dish was a movie I adored when it first came out. It was like 91 or something. I was in junior high school. I didn't mm-hmm. even watch soap operas at the time, but I kind of got like what they were spoofing. And the, yeah. the, the, the lives of soap, soap opera actors are even more dramatic than their fictional counterparts. Um, it was really broad. It was really funny. And I think the jokes just... I'll feel miserably dated when I watched it in, in the, the modern day. The pacing is just off. The, the silliness feels a lot less silly. It just kind of lost all of its power. I actually rewatched mm. it not that long ago, mm. and I st- still thought it was really crackerjack. Yeah. I missed yeah. that sort of uh, fast pace, slamming mm. doors, really yeah. broad characterizations. And I think Soap Dish is actually, in a lot of ways, kind of like ahead of its time. Like it kind of predicted something. Because at the time, you know. Daytime soap operas. Soap Dish is a is a broad comedy about the making of a daytime soap opera, mm. and um, great cast. Great uh, cast. Sally Field, Kevin Klein, Robert Downey Jr., Whoopi Kathy Goldberg, Murray, Whoopi Goldberg, Elizabeth and, Shue. It, yeah. It's fantastic. Um, at the time, daytime soap operas were still alive and well, and the idea was they wanted to. They were worried about sinking in the ratings, and they needed to big put, put big ratings pushes there. And what they ended up doing was they ended up making more out of the real life drama of mm. the actors, and they kind of presaged the advent of reality television. There's actually like it's it's kind of interesting to see in that context. Mm. I'm not saying that you know we need to all hail soap dish, but yeah. like it's interesting, and I I like that one. What I actually find often is that. I like movies better than I did when I was a kid. And I'll give you an example of one of both. Mm. Um, Not that long ago, you and I uh, watched all of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. Mm. And I discovered that Nightmare on Elm Street 2, which I did not like when I was younger, Mm. has aged really well. (laughs) Like, it's actually, like, one of the most, like, really potently psychological, Mm. scary and really distinctive films in that entire franchise, and it has a hell of a lot more to say than most of them, too. Yeah. Like, it's scary, it works, it, it messes with some of the rules, but a lot of those rules weren't even codified until after 2 came out, yeah. so it doesn't bother me. Well, they, they were just making it up as they went along, like all the horror franchises. I, I understand they were making it up as they go along, but it it, do, it fails even under its own internal logic, like, not even compared to the it's rest of the franchise. It's dream logic! Like, it didn't, it wasn't, like, trying to treat it like a comic I'm not, I'm not talking about dream logic, I'm talking about just 
basic cinema, but yeah. Okay. Um, but as another example, mm-hmm. um, I remember always being a really, really big fan of Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are. It's a cool concept. It's about a bunch of kids decide to fight back against Freddy mm-hmm. using, uh, you know, it's their dreams. They can do whatever they want in them. Uh, so they take on sort of the persona of superheroes in a lot of respects. One kid does magic. Another mm-hmm. one is a fantastic gymnast and all that kind of stuff. And it's a cool concept. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't care for it as much the second time. Now, I'm not going to say it's bad. The special effects are fantastic. There's some really cool stuff in there. There's a lot of really great imaginative stuff in there. There's some really imaginative stuff in there, and sometimes that's all you really want from Mm -hmm. a Nightmare on Elm Street sequel. However, all that stuff I thought was really cool is kind of thrown into the third act. Mm -hmm. All the new backstory stuff with Freddy is terrible. Everything that happens at the junkyard makes no sense whatsoever. (laughs) And it's another one where they break the rules. Like, the whole Mm -hmm. point is, well, we believe we have superpowers, therefore we can fight Freddy. It's a very positive version of the Mm. story. And yet, the kid who's like the sorcerer, he like shoots magic at Freddy, and Freddy just says, I don't believe in magic, and kills him. And I'm Mm. like, you literally said that's not how that worked. (laughs) So... No, you can't well, do that. It's another one that just fucking breaks it. Uh, well, you, you watch the first of Nightmare on Elm Street. There's this bit at the end where, like, Nancy is finally facing off against Freddy Krueger, who she's pulled into the real world. And she says, you know what? We've been fighting this whole time, but I'm not afraid of you and you have no power over me. It's like, wait, when was that the theme of this you movie? You just kind of introduced that shit. at the end. It's like, yeah, yeah that, that has and nothing then, to do with anything. And then, of course, there's another bit at the end, which is basically just like, nah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Fuck uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's really like plot wise kind of a shabby film, but it's, the whole it's franchise, just such a great idea. The whole franchise is really inconsistent mm-hmm. logic, so it bothers me when people like throw that out with two. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. And Dream Child makes sense <laughs> to you. Dream Child is interesting because if if you watch it, it, like it doesn't really have a story. <laughs> I've seen Dream Child many times. No idea what happens in it. Yeah, yeah. no idea. You just remember the dream all. sequences and like the the yeah. woman inside the waterbed yeah, and all kinds of weird stuff. There's cool. Well, the, the, was the waterbed thing Dream Child? I thought that was uh, Dream Master. Oh, that was yeah, that was part four. I'm yeah. sorry. Dream yeah. Master is actually pretty good. Yeah. Um. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so that's another example of that. Let's do one more quick letter. All right. Um, here is a letter from uh, Brendan. Hello, okay. Brendan. Uh, Dear Bibbs and Whitney, I was watching Mystery Men for the first time the other day. Yay! Uh, I, I I wanted this letter because we talked about Mystery Men. Um, mm. And while I found I uh, liking a lot of it, including the performances and the writing, I found the direction super off-putting. Mm-hmm. The movie was directed by some co- uh, a commercials director named Kinka Usher, who never directed a movie again. Uh, therefore, every shot in the movie is designed to have maximum impo- impact, resulting in a lot of shots at extreme angles and a lot of close-ups. Uh, Nathan Rabin? Rabin? Rabin. I've never known how to pronounce his uh, name. Na- Nathan Rabin put it best in his Year of Flops column on Mystery Men when he said that Mystery Men is better than any than any movie that looks this much like Batman and Robin has any right to be. I feel that the film required a more minimalist style to fit with the second-rate superheroes at the center of the story. Someone like Jim Jarmusch would have been great. Okay. Plus Tom Waits is in it, so why not? Um, I was wondering, what are some films that you like in spite of their direction? Okay, um, I'm going to start with saying this. First off, I think that's a very observant thought about Mystery Men. But I also think that that was an intentional choice because you got to remember a lot of the superhero movies that were coming out prior to Mystery Men were as broadly Super overpro- stylish. They yeah. were overproduced. And I think it, I think making it look like Batman and Robin and Batman Forever was an intentional choice. That was the kind of superhero story they were lampooning at the time. And if you like the more minimalist approach, again, I recommend you check out uh, the, the specials, specials yeah. which is really, really fun, very low budget, intimate uh, superhero story about like the seventh greatest superhero team in the world on their day off. <laughs> uh, and it's got Thomas Hayden Church. And it's James, all conversation. There's yeah. no action in it. Uh, t- James Gunn wrote the screenplay. It's really witty. If that's your jam, that's your jam. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'll say that. I think that works in Mystery Men, but I see your point. Uh, that sort of wild uh, art deco. Uh, Roger Ebert used the really, uh, really great phrase to describe Batman and Robin. He called it an art deco garbage disposal. (laughs) And I I love that description. And I think, yeah, first of all, that's the style they're lampooning. But I think it adds this kind of energetic chaos to mystery men that I think a a minimalist style would have uh, would have undercut. I think it might have been a little too mellow for its own good. Uh, These are these really outsized superheroes living in a world where superheroes exist. You need a heightened reality to explain something like the spleen. Um, (laughs) Now, 
Mystery Men came out of Flaming Carrot comics, and Flaming Carrot was sort of like a, a blue-collar superhero. I think it's called a blue-collar superhero a lot in those comics. And if you were to make a Flaming Carrot movie, that's such a strange character that you would need to set it in, like, Modesto, California, like some place that has no features whatsoever. Um, when you have the Mystery Men and you're trying to really make this really broad superhero universe, yeah, I think it kind of needs to look that way. So I'm going to defend that. Yeah. To answer your question, however, is there a movie I like despite its direction? That's uh, that's a tough one. I'm going to throw out mm. Sabotage, directed by David <laughs> Ayer. Okay. David Ayer is a director who's like really hit or miss with me. When he mm. hits, he hits hard. Yeah. When he misses, he misses hard. <laughs> and when he hits in the middle, it's Sabotage. Sabotage is a story about a bunch of corrupt cops who, like, steal a bunch of money, but then someone's killing off all the cops one by one. It's a very pulpy premise. All Schwarzenegger stars in it. It's not his movie. It's Mariel Enos' movie. Yeah, Mariel yeah. Enos from, uh, <laughs> from The Killing, and she's got some other show I'm, I, I'm not familiar with. Uh, she owns that movie. <laughs> she's a Batman villain trapped in another film. Yeah. Also, I think Olivia Williams is in that movie and mm. she's it's it's basically their film, but the emphasis is way more on like the male characters. Yeah, it's yeah. like it doesn't know that it's not the movie that it is. Hmm. So, it's like it plays off as this really boss macho badass thing. Yeah, and really yeah. this is totally you know macho as well, but like it's her film and the movie doesn't know it and it's frustrating, but she's so damn good that yeah. I don't mind. Yeah. And like the, the movie is a mess, but I dig it because of these elements that just pop out mm. that I think I, I, I know he intended to make them good characters, but like they're so much better than the film. Yeah. So that's one example I thought uh, of. I can't, God, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, unfortunately. Yeah, where it's just like you like it mm-hmm. even though it's like the emphasis is off or they yeah. they messed it up somehow. John Carpenter I, is one of those directors. I like every single one of his movies, even the ones that are bad. Uh, I, there's a couple that push and, me too far. Well, I, I know Village of the Damned. Yeah, no, nobody's really going to come go to bat for Village of the Damned. But here's the thing: when I saw Village of the Damned in the theaters, I was thrilled. Thought it was fine. Okay. It, it did its job. Um, I think Prince of Darkness is one of his weaker movies. I like that. And movie. yet I still really enjoy watching it. Here, I'll, I'll say Ghosts of, Dark, uh, Ghosts of Mars. Ghosts of Mars is another Ghosts one. Ghosts of Mars is, is like not a particularly good movie. There's like a lot of really obvious flaws in that movie. Mm. It's a fun watch. Yeah. It's it entertaining. You know, I, just, it never goes from good to great. If, if you're looking for a sci-fi action spectacular, Ghosts of Mars is going to look super low-fi. It's like super cheap. It, yeah. lo- it looks terrible. It's the B slash C movie version of that. If you think of it as a Western, which it is, because it's about freeing a guy from prison and at the end of the movie they're throwing like dynamite off the back of a train. Yeah, it's totally like, a Western. Yeah, it's a totally a Western. And I think it functions better if you're in that mindset. John Carpenter spent his entire career not making Westerns mm-hmm. and constantly making Westerns. Making Westerns. Like he couldn't do it. Like he could never get a Western off the ground. But like you look at a lot of his movies. Assault on Precinct 13. Mm-hmm. Is is, totally is a re- a well, it's a remake of Rio Bravo. Yeah, so. Escape from New York is very much in the mold of a Western. Uh, Va- Vampires is a straight up Western. Totally it's a like Western takes place in, yeah, in, uh, in New Mexico in the deserts. I don't think they yeah. ever get on horseback, but e- they may even, as well have. E- even Prince of Darkness is a haunted mission movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it really is. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that J- John Carpenter... Like even when he's not directing well, he's still mm. directing well. Mm. But, uh, which which might not be quite what you're asking for, but that's, mm. that's all I can come up with right now. All right, well, listen, everybody, thank you for writing in. We'll read more letters next week. You can email us, and actually, we have a new email address. We do. Uh, now, that's if you send it to our old email address, critically acclaimed fans at gmail dot net we'll, uh, gmail dot com, we'll still get it. Mm-hmm. However, we do have a new one, and we encourage you to use it. It's letters mm-hmm. at criticallyacclaimed.net. Hmm? Send Letter, them along. Letters at criticallyacclaimed.net. Do it. Yeah, send them along. Uh, we have some cool stuff coming in the pipeline. I was hoping to have it ready in time for this episode. We won't, but uh, <laughs> we'll be making a quick announcement on the Schmoville Facebook page soon and on Twitter. Um, and uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about it on the next episode of Critically Acclaimed. And on the next episode of Critically Acclaimed, we will be reviewing the new releases Solo, a Star Wars story, mm-hmm. and Mary Shelley.
And Mary Shelley. Ooh. <laughs> um, and uh, that's uh, well, that's basically that. Um, oh, also, and, and, and whatever else we can catch, because yeah. there are several other new releases. And, I, and listen, if you if you want more, um, like we have the Cancel Too Soon podcast, we review TV shows last at one season or less. Our next episode, we'll have a very special guest, uh, and it will be a review of the Karen Gillan John Cho sitcom Selfie, mm-hmm. uh, which is one of our more requested programs. Um, also, I was recently on the JTE Movie Thinks podcast talking about Ooh. the horror anthology film The House That Dripped Blood. And I know I screwed something up, so I'm just going to own it right now. Mm. I confused Denholm Elliott with Desmond Llewellyn. <gasps> How dare you, Denholm, sir? Denholm Elliott uh, from a- uh, from uh, Razor Lost Ark and Last Crusade. Uh, he he starred in The House That Dripped Blood, and I kept calling him Desmond, Desmond Llewellyn. Who was a Q first- in the James Bond movies. Yep. I, you can see how I did that. I pulled a Dylan McDermott and Dermot Mulroney on that but I you know that. what I feel bad I I, I uh, with the release year of Battleship Potemkin by nearly a decade mm-hmm. this very episode so we all make mistakes it's there fine. you go yeah. uh, uh, Drew McQueenie one of the new uh, kings of the Schmodown uh-huh. uh, on the most recent um, Schmodown Rundown podcast uh, said several times uh, <laughs> that uh, Donald Sutherland was in the original The Italian Job he, he was not. Bob Mike, Michael Caine? Yeah, it? Michael Caine, who, Noel Coward, Benny who, Hill. What what role was he to have played in the original The Italian I don't John? know, but when they were talking about the remake and he was like, oh yeah, Donald Sutherland, I knew it was someone from the original. Mm-hmm. Nope. Nope. My point is, I'm not trying to throw him under the bus, although I am, of course, challenging him soon, I hope. <laughs> uh, which, you, which you're totally doing. Yeah, right like now. totally, <laughs> like you, you, me, like, you know, let's, let's get mm-hmm. in there and let's try to take that team belt. But um, my point is, everyone makes mistakes. Yeah. Am I a jerk? No, no, no. <laughs> is this just smoke on smack talk? That's what it, I was it's, going it's, for. It's just smack talk. It's okay, fine. I love him. He'll he'll just smack you back, and you smack him back, and that's the way this works. Okay. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening. Uh, uh, we are on Twitter. I'm at William Debiani. I'm at Whitney Seibold. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll be back next week with uh, more stuff and things. And uh, never forget, everyone's a critic. I wanna go to the midnight show. I'm sorry. What? <laughs>